Good morning, everyone. Just to confirm that everyone can hear me, please use the chat box to let me know if you can hear me. Thank you very much. Um, good day, ladies and gentlemen, panelists, participants, and everyone watching. Um, it is now 12 o'clock, so we would begin the seminar. Um, my name is Titi Lokbe Adirokun, and I'm currently the Chief Research Officer of the Lex Lata Center for International Law and Comparative Constitutionalism in Africa. And today I would be your host as well. Um, I would like to officially welcome you all to the Lex Lata Career Seminar 2020. Um, over the past few months, the center has worked tirelessly to bring this to fruition, and it's so remarkable to see um, everything come you know, together today. In the last four weeks, the center received registrations from over 280 students in 47 universities um, in 10 countries and four continents. We're so glad to have you all here with us on this Zoom platform, as well as YouTube Live. There is so much that we have in store for you today. Um, our amazing panelists are experienced and excellent professionals from across the fields of international law, corporate law, and arbitration. And they'll be answering all your pressing questions on these areas of law. At today's seminar, we'll be having three panel sessions in the aforementioned areas of law. Now, each panel session would run in this format. First, we'll have the introduction and the reading of the citation of the guest after which we'll have the panel session for 30 minutes. Then we'll take questions and answers from the audience for 10 minutes. Then after this, we'll go on a short break for five minutes during which participants are encouraged to network with each other during this time. Then after this break, the next panel session will kick off and to all the Hands, but you know, just for emphasis sake. Now, participants are expected to have their cameras on at all times. Can everyone hear me, please? Hello, can everyone hear me? Yes, we can. OK, thank you very much. Thank you so much. Sorry for that little technical error. Um, yeah, last but not the least, as I was saying, all participants are encouraged to rename themselves in this format. First, your name, then your university, and then the country where you're from. Um, Without further ado, I would like to welcome the Executive Director of the Lex Latter Center for International Law and Comparative Constitutionalism in Africa, in the person of Dr. Wale Kunuji, to give the welcome address. Please give me a few seconds to share my screen while you welcome him virtually in the chat box. Thank you very much, Titi. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. And it's my pleasure to welcome you to this very important event, the first of its kind in the history of this organization. As some of you probably know already, the Lex Latter Center was established a few years ago to foster cutting head research and adversary work in the fields of international and constitutional law in Africa. In the last two years, 
We have provided standard research training to several undergraduate students in these two fields. And early this month, we finally launched our graduate research fellowship program, which is intended to be the centerpiece of our work at the research organization. Plans are already afoot to expand the scope and quality of our work over the next few years, with the inclusion of a range of research-oriented studies, conferences, workshops, and our itineraries, as, as well as the pursuit of mutually beneficial collaboration with policymakers and public institutions. I'm delighted to report that we have made significant progress in the last two years, in spite of challenging budget constraints and difficult operating environment. As a result, I have no doubt that our primary goal of becoming Africa's foremost research organization by 2035 is realizable if we may in the moment. And I assure you that we shall return to the moment. Now, some of you may be wondering why a research organization is taking the initiative to organize a career seminar like this. I will explain shortly. In the course of interacting with our graduate students and junior research fellows over the last few months, <coughs> we observed that not a few of them were particularly unsure of the exact career path they took as they navigate life after school. Unlike what obtains in some higher institutions to have efficient career counseling units, many students in this part of the world do not have access to expert career advice to guide them in making a choice. As a result, many graduates have found themselves in fields that they know nothing about or fields that they are completely unsuited to. In light of the foregoing, we thought we could help to ameliorate this problem by organizing a career seminar that will give students and graduates an overview of the options available to them. And what it takes to excel in any field of culture. I'm glad that today we are having that seminar. Today's seminar is focused on careers in international law and education and public law. Since we intend to make this a yearly event, subsequent career seminars will explore more specific career options in fields like energy law, telecommunications law, cyber law, intellectual property law. Law of the sea, maritime law, as well as other emerging fields in the legal services industry. Let me seize this opportunity to sincerely thank all our speakers who have created time out of their very busy schedule to attend this event. We are indeed very grateful. This is part of your contribution to nation building, and it is greatly appreciated. We believe that the sacrifice you're making today will be greatly rewarded. Thank you very much. I would also like to say a very big thank you to the committee responsible for organizing this event. This committee is led by Titi Mokia Adedogo, our chief research officer. Titi and the rest of the team work day and night to ensure the success of today's event. We are very proud of this group. The efficient manner in which they have executed the task of trying to do is a loud testament to the Tandu spirit and the enterprising energy of our young people. It shows that given the right platform, our young people can break, can break barriers and change the course of history. They can move on and continue challenges. Thank you, Titi, and thank you to all members of the community. It is now time for us to listen to and dialogue with our English speakers. It's my hope that the discussions that follow will be stimulating and enlightening. Thank you for listening, and I wish you all the most successful seminar. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir, for that wonderful address. And um, we would now move to the second item on the agenda, which is a short presentation on, Lex on the Lex Letter Center for about five minutes. I'm sure a lot of you are wondering, like, what is the Lex Letter Center? What do we do? Um, what are the opportunities that we have at the center? And this will hopefully answer all your burning questions. So please give me a few seconds to um, share my screen and then we'll move on. Just to confirm, um, can everyone see my screen please? Thank you. 
Okay, thank you very much. Um, so I'll just go ahead with the um, um, with the presentation. Now, the Lex Latter Center for International Law and Comparative Constitutionalism in Africa, a constituent unit of the Lex Latter Group, is a research advocacy and advisory organization dedicated to the progressive study and analysis of international and constitutional law as these fields relate to Africa. We advise governments and international organizations on matters relating to international law, private and public, justice, rule of law, human rights, constitutionalism, and democracy on the African continent. What we do. Now, our research and technical expertise spans the broad areas of international law, private and public, international development, democracy, human rights, constitutionalism, conflict prevention, I mean, crisis management, and peace building. We advise and assist public and private institutions in formulating and designing legislative policy and constitutional reforms in these areas. Now on to our project. The Lex Letter Center is undertaking um, a number of projects, the first of which is the ICC project. Now this project is commissioned by the Lex, um, by the Lex Letter Center, I mean, in commemoration of the 20th anniversary of the signing of the Rome Statutes. Is a permanent project of the center designed to continuously analyze and evaluate the contributions of the International Criminal Court to international law in general and the international criminal law in, part and in, in particular, I mean. Currently, the project is focused on the principle of complementarity with five interns of the center examining the concepts, examining 13 states, as well as creating manuals which will guide African states, individuals, bodies, and organizations on positive complementarity approaches to the prosecution of international law crimes, of international crimes, I mean, by African states as envisaged by the Rome Statutes. Our second project is called the AU project. Now, this is the permanent, this is a permanent project of the Lex Letter Center designed to encourage the progressive study of the African Union and its institutions. It is intended to be Lex Latter's contribution to the African Renaissance project. Now, this project will be simultaneously implemented in parts. Previously, the project looked at the African peace and security architecture. However, right now, the pro the project, I mean, it's focused on democracy in Africa in relation to aspiration three of the AU's agenda 2063, with three interns examining the concepts, its African framework, as well as creating draft articles aimed at filling the gaps in the current framework. Now let's go to our research fellowships. Um, we have a number of research fellowships. Um, which um, of which one is the Junior Research Fellowship in International Law. Now, this is an integral part of the Center's Vision 2035 Knowledge Sharing Agenda that is aimed at encouraging the progressive study and analysis of public and private international law issues relating to Africa. With this fellowship program, the Center aims to address the paucity of African perspectives in the extant international law literature. Currently, the Center has five Junior Research Fellows who are law graduates. They will work with the center for one year on various research projects. Now their research topics cover issues such as international law and gender, crimes against humanity, data protection, international trade and investment, as well as investment treaty arbitration. Please just know that you're still with me and you're still following. Please let me know in the comment session. Thank you. Um, now on to our internships. We have the research internship program. Now this is a research-based internship for law undergraduates within and outside Africa. The interns are tasked with conducting research and writing projects on specific aspects of international law and comparative constitutionalism in Africa. Now, the internship is completely virtual and thus all the activities of the internship are completely held online. The interns conduct research, make presentations, write papers, reports, and essays, as well as briefs on happenings in international and local law. Currently, the center has eight interns who work with the center's ICC and AU projects, who work with the center's ICC and AU projects, and the interns are also writing a joint article on COVID-19 and international law. Now, let's go to the very interesting parts. What are the opportunities at Lex Latter? 
At Lex Latter, there are several opportunities, one of which is the Lex Latter Research Internship. Now, the applications are usually in cycles, so our next application will open in late 2020 slash early 2021. Now, the second opportunity that we have is the Junior Research Fellowship. We have just um, inducted a new cycle of the Junior Research Fellows, and new applications will open mid-2021. Also, we have the Research Fellowship. Now, this is aimed at, you know, um, lawyers that have a master's in law. And also, we have the Senior Research Fellowship, which is aimed at lawyers with a PhD. Now, um, just like this, Lex Lata, um organizes several events as we can see the Lex Letter Career Seminar. And then um, very importantly, we're also going to be organizing another event in November called the Lex Lata Re Online Research and Policy Conference, which will be themed the future of international criminal justice in Africa. So I encourage everybody to follow our social media pages, LinkedIn, Instagram, and check our websites to know how you can be part of this program. And more details, of course, will be coming soon. Um, if you have any um, inquiries or you need more information on exactly the opportunities at Lex Latter, please visit the center's website or email, um, which is careers at lexlattercenter.com. Now, um, Now, this is, um, these are our contact information. You can um, go to our website, you can go to Instagram, LinkedIn, and you can also send us an email address on um, more, um, to know more, I mean, about the center. And here are some pictures from some of our, um, our events and some of our presentations that we've held. Thank you for your time and do enjoy the rest of the seminar. Please just give me a few seconds to stop sharing my screen and get back. Here. So I hope all of you enjoyed that short presentation. So at this point, we're getting closer to the first panel session of the day, which is the international law session. But before we do, allow me to briefly give an introduction of all our panelists for today's seminar. I'll quickly run through it um, so that we, um, we, um, we remain within the range of time. For the international law session, we have two amazing panelists, uh, Mr. Adeto Kumbo Hussein and Mr. Tisungen Makato. Now, Mr. Adeto Kumbo is an international law consultant at the International Nuremberg Principles Academy, while Mr. Makato is an associate at Volterra Theatre, a global law firm that is dedicated to public international law. For the corporate law session, our first panelist, Ms. Jesu Tofumi Ola Benjo, is a senior associate at Alukwanoi Bode. Um, a reputable tier one law firm noted for its work across sectors, locally and internationally. Unfortunately, due to unforeseen circumstances, um, our second panelist, Ms. Dion Brown, would not be joining us today. And last but not the least, our arbitration se session, I mean. For this session, our panelists are Mr. Tolu Obamiro and Ms. Chizaram Uzodima. Now, Mr. Obamiro is an associate in um, White and Case LLP, an international law firm focused in finance, arbitration, mergers and acquisitions, and so on. While Ms. Uzodima is an LLM candidate at the reputable master in international dispute settlement program in Geneva. And prior to this, she worked at SP Ajibadi and co would be Ms. Joa Owolano, Ms. Respectively. Um, can everyone still hear me just to be sure? Yes. Thank you very much. I don't know about the seminar today. And at this time, we'll be going straight into the international law session. And I can see that our panelists are already here, Mr. Ade Tokumbo, as well as Mr. Makoto, Mr. Makato, excuse me. Um, I would now hand over to the moderator, Ms. Jo Owolano, to begin the session. Thank you very much, Titi. Good morning, good afternoon, depending on wherever you're watching from all over the world. And you are welcome to the International Law Panel session of the Lex Lata Career Seminar. My name is Joel Owolano, and I will be moderating this panel session. Please note that this panel lasts for 30 minutes. Yeah, and I, I have with me here two amazing guests who will be our panelists for today's session. Titi has introduced them, but I will go, go ahead to read their profiles. But before then, a few housekeeping rules. We will take questions from the audience, but at the end of the panel session, and it's going to last for, 20, for 10 minutes, I beg your pardon, please ask them in the chat box. 
Secondly, please show your enthusiasm and your excitement so our speakers know that you're following. You can use the clap features Zoom has, has provided, or you could just respond in the comments. That said, please join me to welcome Mr. Tokumbo Toks Hussein and Mr. Tisingani Makato. Audience, you know what to do. Please respond in the comments. You're welcome, Toks. You're welcome, Tisu. Thank Great you. to have you here. Thank you. Thank you. Great, so I'll be reading their profiles respectively, starting with Tokumbo. Ade Tokumbo Tokes Hussein is an international law consultant at the International Nuremberg Principles Academy. Tokes was previously a legal intern in the office of the President of the United Nations International Rest Law Mechanism for Criminal Tribunals, and now joins the Stanisich International Defense Team led by Wayne Jordash. Prior to working in the mechanism, he was assistant to counsel in the China Tribunal led by Sir Geoffrey Nice. Tux also serves as the head of the British Nigeria Law Forum Junior Lawyers Division. In his capacity, he hosted the popular webinar entitled International Justice and Africa, which featured prominent speakers from, from the International Court of Justice, the International Criminal Court, and others. Some of his notable awards include Professional Development Award BPP University 2020, Rising Star Award, British Nigeria Forum, Best Defense Oralist, Association of Defense Council practicing before the International Court and Tribunals in 2019. In 2020, Tox created the now popular show, Law Talks to Tox. You are welcome, Tox. Great to have you here. Thank you. Pleasure to Great. be here. Great. So I will be reading Mr. Tsungane's bio. Tisungane Tisu is an associate at Volterra Theatre, a public international law firm in London, United Kingdom. He advises and represents sovereign states, corporate clients, and international organizations on a wide range of contentious, contentious and non-contentious public international law matters, investment protection, and risk. He ap has appeared before the International Court of Justice. He holds an LLB degree from the University of Malawi, an LLM, Energy Law and Policy, from the University of Dundee, and an LLM from the prestigious Harvard Law School. He is admitted to practice law as a legal practitioner in the High Court of Malawi. We also welcome Ms. Mr. Tisu. Great to have you, you here. Much. Thank you. Great. So we'll just go on to the panel session for today. And without further ado, we'll begin right away. So this question is to you, Talks. Um, what are the career options within the field of international law? Is being a professor of law the peak of a career in international law? And how easy is it to switch between career paths within the field? Well, firstly, thank you to everybody here for attending. And thank you very much, Lex Latter, for this generous invitation. Uh, I hope you can hear me well. Loud and clear. Great. Uh, so uh, great question, the career options within international law. I think there are several options to uh, consider. Uh, I'm just going to break them down as follows. So the first option is the court system. Uh, by that, I'm referring to the International Criminal Court, the International Court of Justice. You have ad hoc tribunals, for example, the UN mechanism where I work at the moment, a special tribunal for Lebanon, etc. Um, and within those organizations or within the court system, uh, there are several roles where one can work in. So, for example, you have the prosecution, you have defense, you have registry or even the victims unit. And within the registry, that really is the uh, branch of these organizations that run um, the diplomatic function. For example, if you are if you were to work in the uh, mechanism, for, for example, so you'd be involved with UN correspondence and relations as such. So that's the court system. Uh, the next is international organizations. And within that, you have organizations such as the ICRC, which is the International Committee um, of the Red Cross. Uh, you have uh, several NGOs you can work for which deal with international work. Uh, for example, there's Amnesty International. Um, then if you want to work within your local jurisdiction, you may consider a career within the military. And so that, for instance, could be 
uh, being a legal advisor or being a lawyer, and you might advise on the law of war or humanitarian law. Uh, you could work in a law firm, for example, um, in which case you engage in advisory work or maybe defense work. And lastly, um, academia is very uh, popular to consider. So research opportunities, we could also be a lecturer. Um, in terms of the other part of your question, whether, um, you know, being a professor of law is, is something which you want to consider, I think that it's it's something which many professionals do in practice. Um, indeed, people work as practitioners and they go into lecturing as well. And it's something which you, you could do. It's not unusual at all. Um, just remind me, what's the last part of your question? Yeah, I said, how easy is it to switch between career paths? Between academia and um, yes. being in practice? Yes. Well. People do it all the time, but I think you have to be um, advised and guided by the market. You know, if there's a if there's a market place and there are job opportunities, you may wish to consider it. Uh, if not, then probably think very carefully exactly what you want to do. But in practice, people do it all the time. So I hope that assists with the first question. Yes, thank you so much, Tok. So it's not unusual to switch between career paths in international law. You just have to be aware of the markets. Great, thank you so okay. much, Tox. So the next question is to you, Tisu. For undergraduates, how important is it to identify an area of specialization early on? And how can a student deal with not having clarity as to the particular area he or she wants to work in? Then lastly, are there any dangers in specializing too early? Um, well, I, I'm speaking from my own experience. I, I, I think that uh, when you're a law student, that's the time for you to explore, um, you know, the various uh, branches uh, and you know, fields of law. So, I mean, for an undergraduate, I would encourage, um, you know, that, uh, you know, you explore, um, you know, the various fields of law that are being um, offered um, at, at your university so that you um, identify what um, you really like. And um, I think what, what, what many people have sort of um, experienced is that, that what you thought you liked when you were, you were in, in um, university is not necessarily what you end up liking after university. So, I, I, I generally, I would encourage you know, um, you know, and and the graduates to to explore, uh, to explore constitutional law, torts, trusts, um, you know, international law, and, and and so on and so forth. And then, um, if you know, if they have identified what um, they would like um, to do, or uh, the field of law that they would like to specialize in, and then probably they can take that up when you know immediately after they um, they. They, they, they graduate to see if that is something that they would, would really like to do. I remember when I was um, an undergraduate student at University of Malawi, I thought that I would end up being a corporate lawyer. And I wrote my, I wrote my um, um, LLB thesis on uh, corporate law. But when I graduate, I sort of realized that corporate law is not what I really wanted to do. And then I practiced for you know, a, a number of years and then you know, I proceeded to do my uh, postgraduate um, education. So, I mean, that, that, that is, um, th those are my views. And uh, with respect to um, specializing early, again, um, it's, I, I, would, I would encourage you know, uh, undergraduates to have an open mind because um, when you're a bit younger, just you know, fresh from university, you, you're still exploring. So you should not, you know, um, you know, fix your mind on a, you know, a specific or particular uh, field of law because, you know, our tests change with time, one. Two, there's also the market uh, reality. If you are working in a smaller economy, a smaller country like Malawi, you're likely to be um, a generalist pretty much doing everything. But in, you know, uh, bigger, you know, bigger economies, you really have to specialize in, you know, um, or to choose a, a 
specific field of law. So if you have chosen a certain specific uh, field of law, but then um, it's not, you know, people, probably there are no jobs in that field of law, you know, that may, that may not necessarily be a, a good uh, position to be in. So just keep an open mind and um, explore um, as many fields of law as, as you like. And with time, you get to sort of know which uh, field of law um, suits you. Thank you, Tisu. So keep an open mind and explore. Tox, I could see you nodding your, your head. Do you have anything to add? I agree entirely with everything that uh, Tisu has said. You know, when you are young in law school, uh, you just start, you get excited about it, anything you study. But there's also a difference between um, practice and, and theory. So don't just get very excited uh, about tort law and say, oh, I want to do tort, and, and that's it. Be very open because your mind might change uh, in, in a few years from now. So I, I entirely uh, agree with everything Tissi was said. Um, very well put. Thank you, Tox. So to you now, how can undergraduate law students prepare themselves for a career in public or private international law while still at university? Um, I think, uh, to be honest, it's the same thing you do to prepare yourself for a career to be a lawyer anyway. You know, you need to master the basics of law, you know, the criminal law, uh, tort, contract, public law. Uh, of course, um, one thing I, I should say at this point is that uh, certainly with international criminal law, it is a uh, it's a compromise between different systems, with, between common law, civil law. So if you have at least an appreciation of how common law works or how civil law works, that's good. You don't have to be an expert in, in terms of the, the substance of it, but at least be familiar with it. And um, one thing which is also perhaps evident, or, or maybe it's not so evident, is that international law, be it public international or private international law, as much as it is very practical, it's also very academic. And most people who tend to go into these areas are people who are very intelligent and very bright. So um, make sure that if you want to achieve the best chances to practice in this field, do very well academically. You know, try and be the best uh, because it's very competitive. That is the reality. Um, in terms of other things that you could do from now, uh, you should be very interested in international affairs, what's going on in the world. And um, you should also develop what's called uh, commercial awareness. And if you're somebody who is interested in private international law, arbitration, I know other speakers are going to talk about these in due course, uh, you should be following what's going on on the news, you know, in the legal world, which merger has happened, what is the ramification for this company buying this company, or what's the implication of the UN um, sanction on this country, etc. So be following these things um, right from now. And also, it's very important to read around these subjects, you know, if you want to go into public international law, what does it actually mean? Find out about it. Um, I've, I, I think you should have all received um, a PowerPoint presentation I prepared in advance and sent to everybody. So that just has some basics and some of the things you may wish to know. Uh, so read about these subject areas. You don't have to be an expert at this point in time, but at least have an idea of what people are actually involved in and what it involves. And I think the last part of how you could prepare yourself is to uh, network from now. It's never too early to network with uh, professionals. Um, let me give a little word warning, though, when it comes to networking. Um, you have to be very sensible when you approach uh, practitioners because, A, uh, these are people who are very busy, and, two, you need to have uh, what I consider to be a, a value proposition, and by that I mean what can you do for them? How can you be of service to them as well? Remember, it's a two-way street. If, if you reach somebody, let's say on LinkedIn, and you say, hey, I've always wanted to do international law. Can you help me out? It's like, fine, that's nice. But at the same time, too, you know, what do I get from this exchange? Um, and one practical way you could consider, for example, is 
to offer research assistance to somebody in, in their work. Of course, that doesn't mean you're going to be paid, but to say, hey, um, I'm very interested in public international law. In particular, I'm interested in international criminal law. In other words, I'm asking you to be specific in your approach, exactly what you need. Um, I've, I've developed this interest and, and I'm willing to offer some research assistance if you think this is something which might be helpful to you in terms of any other assistance I can provide. Now, as a practitioner, I am more inclined to listen to what that person has to say rather than the other nine people who contacted me last week to just say they're interested, help me, give me a job. So uh, be very sensible in how you network. So uh, those are some of the tips which I, I would offer from now, which you can develop. And um, lastly, just um, follow webinars and presentations, things like this event, for example, they're very helpful just to develop your, your knowledge, your interest, your expertise. Uh, there are also courses, short courses you could do from now to develop an understanding. So go ahead and, and, and do those courses as well. Thank you, Tok. That was very, very detailed. I mean, I can't be begin to list them all, but you said a lot. So um, this is just an agenda. What kind of skills do you think are needed for a successful international practitioner? And what certifications, if any, can law students get to prepare themselves for practice? Is this for me? Yes, yes, this is for okay. you. <laughs> right, okay, great. Um, again, skills needed, it's the skill of any lawyer. Um, it's, it's really that simple. So um, you want to make sure that your drafting skills are excellent. Uh, so so I, I didn't say writing skills, pay attention. I said drafting skills because it's very easy to, to write a story or write a Facebook post. Whereas legal drafting, on the other hand, is an entirely different uh, skill. And if you work in the UN system, it, it has a different style of drafting as well. So you have to be very flexible in terms of how you draft legal documents. So make sure you, 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 you get that, um, you hone those skills if you don't have them already. Um, in terms of actually practicing, it, one thing which gets overlooked, I think, is the fact that uh, you should be a lawyer in the first place, you know, if, if you're going to practice. So, um, you know, I've, I've trained in England. Um, most people, you know, in the international field, they are qualified in their home jurisdiction. So make sure that um, you shouldn't get so caught up in this idea of international law that you forget to actually do the first thing first and try and qualify within your home jurisdiction in the first place. Um, in terms of certifications you mentioned, I think um, a master's degree in international law um, is important as a minimum. Now the field is very competitive and you'd be amazed to know that there are many people who have at least uh, one master's degree in international law. Um, the person that I worked with in the um, president's office um, last year uh, he, he was one of the most brilliant people I'd ever met, and um, he's on his third master's degree now. Wow. So, so, so really, when, when you were talking about masters, you know, I, I'd say that at least one, um, particularly if you don't have as much uh, work experience as you ought to have. That being said, um, it's very important that you have work experience, which you've developed perhaps from a law firm, um, again, um, you want to develop your analytical skills, your reasoning skills, your problem solving skills as well. Um, you should be a competent legal researcher, be able to navigate different sources, be able to use the internet. I, I, I say that as a joke, but in, in reality, uh, yes, you do need the internet to, to navigate things because you're not going to be in a, a, a library all day or perhaps you might be, but, but if you want to be very efficient, you have to learn how to navigate different legal sources to do that. Um, also, you should have an excellent command of language. And by language, um, I mean English uh, and or French. Now, I, I suspect I might be asked about languages in due course. I'm not gonna answer too much about that now, but last, point is uh, diplomacy. Uh, what do I mean by that? Well, 
you're an international sphere. You're going to deal with with um, quite important people in the international sphere. So you have to be diplomatic and and perhaps not be uh, somebody who is very rash because that can have different consequences, which could be very negative. So you have to think about that and um, just be very cautious of that. Let me finally say a, a little bit of a PR project I'm doing next week. I'm, I'm going to host a seminar on professional etiquette and I'm very happy to send the details to uh, to your center if anybody's interested. Just that would be great. to help Thank you, you with other skills to develop as well in the legal field. Anyway, I hope that helps. Yes, it did. Thank you so much, Toth. Tisu, so um, would you advise students who are interested in pursuing LLMs like Toth has said to do this immediately after law school or do it after a few years in practice? So after law school, do they go straight to do their master's or do they wait to practice in their home country before going for a master's? Um, again, speaking from, uh, from a personal experience, um, when you do your master's, after you know gaining a bit of work experience, it helps to um, it it gives you a perspective a perspective that um, someone who does not have work experience may not necessarily have. So and again, as I said um, earlier, yet by that time, if you've if you have worked for a um, you know a number of years, a few years you would have identified what really works for you, um, the type of uh, field that you are interested in. So when you go for your master's, you already know what you want to do and you will be doing a master's obviously in a field that um, you want to specialize in. And then because of uh, the experience, the work experience that gives you a perspective. Unlike someone who has not um, has not gained any experience at all. They're just fresh uh, from, from university. Probably this is why some universities, especially in, in the US, they will, they, um, as, as, a, as an entry requirement, they want you to have at least two years experience because they believe that um, at that level, if you have at least two years um, experience, you have a perspective. And then that also enriches, you know, your experience as a postgraduate student. So um, from that, I, I would, I, I would advise, I would suggest that uh, probably it's better to, um, to do your masters after you have um, gained a bit of, uh, of, of work experience. Because I think in in the end, it it it, it gives you it gives you um, a really good a really good perspective and. Um, if your aim is to um, um, look for a job in the international law field um, after your master's, then I think that that will also fit in very well because then you would already have um, experience and the skills that um, you know uh, Tokumbo was talking about, and then you have um, you have your master's. So by the, by the time you're graduating from from your master's. You're, you pretty much have um, you're a full package. You're ready to present yourself to prospective um, employers. Whereas if you don't have um, experience, then you have to you know look for um, entry level uh, positions, probably in your home country, because um, internationally you may not be as competitive as someone who has who has um, experience. So I would I would I would encourage you know young people. Um, to first of all, after graduating, to um, um, look for a job, get some experience, get the skills, and then thereafter, do your master's, probably that will place you on, on a better footing. Thanks, Tisu. Now we'll talk about internships now. So, talks. this is for you. So there's a popular belief among students that international law internships are hard to come by. So you've interned at the UN International Restoration Mechanism for Criminal Tribunals at the Hague for more than a year now. So what was the application process like? And what tips and advice would you give students with little or no experience looking up to take up international internships at international organizations or international courts and tribunals? The, the first um, 
the first point is, uh, is very straightforward. You, you apply through the UN job system, which is called Inspira. That's the short answer. And when you apply through Inspira, you, you fill out your profile, you put in all the documents, for example, your um, proof of your academic qualifications, um, recommendation letters, uh, transcripts, and other things as well. Basically, that's, that's the short answer. But in terms of how to actually get it, needless to say, it's very competitive. And the reason why, I, I can't speak for every intern, but I think one thing that helped me when I made my application is the fact that I had a lot of practical experience. And before I uh, got the gig, uh, I was, as you saw in my um, uh, biography, so to speak, I was assistant to um, counsel in, in China Tribunal, which was an international criminal law job that I was doing beforehand. So I did know uh, quite a few things which were very helpful in terms of uh, how to help me do the job that I was going to do. So it, it feeds back into my original point, which is that it's very important to have experience in addition to um, your master's degree, uh, because um, most of the interns who work in these international organizations, you know, these are people who are slightly, they're not too young, let's put it that way, they're not too young. They, they've, they've got some life experience. So don't be too eager to, to try and get into, you know, the UN or ICC like that. Uh, really consider building your your Port, uh, portfolio that's what i would say so if you don't have experience what's the first tip well get experience and one thing you might consider is things like um working in an ngo you might uh, volunteer for um, a local charity do some legal research uh, lex latter just talked about some of the fellowship opportunities you know things like that do it um i, I don't know anybody who has just graduated from their LLB and gone straight to an internship. I'm not saying it, 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 it cannot happen, but I don't know it to happen. So do try and build some life experience uh, beforehand. Um, that really is the best advice I can give. So don't rush into it. These opportunities are there. Most people who have a career within the ICC, the UN, blah, 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 they started out as interns. Yeah. Most people did. So don't, don't feel the need to rush. Try and build local experience and then uh, make your application. That, that would be my advice. Thank you, Tox. Thank you so much. So still on internships, some of these international organizations are unpaid. So even if you do get an internship, there's like little or no um, opportunity to fund for the um, organizations to fund those internships. So how do you suggest students um, participate in these internships with little or no funds? That is uh, a very unfortunate reality that you've referenced, the fact that many of these internships are unpaid. The, the thing is that you need to be able to secure funding externally. And one thing that some interns have done is they have a system where their, their local country, their countries of origin uh, support them. I know that's not unusual. Uh, so perhaps look into your local uh, jurisdiction to see whether there are any type of programs to support uh, practitioners or aspiring practitioners. Uh, in my case, you know, I had uh, lots of scholarships, you know, to, to be able to, to assist me with that. So I was very, I was very fortunate, but I know not everybody is like that. And you, you cannot also work. That's another interesting thing once you're there. So it's very important to try and secure funding. I, I wish there was a magic remedy that I could propose, but the unfortunate reality is that I don't know of such a remedy, um, except just try within your local organizations and see whether there's any type of funding you could uh, secure beforehand. Okay, so look within for opportunities to fund your internships, great, great. So Tisu, um, this is for you. So COVID has changed a lot of things in the world. So there are no conferences, no courses, no physical international law events going on in the world. So how can international law enthusiasts 
enthusiasts, I mean, build solid networks they can leverage on during this period. And lastly, do you think virtual internships are also, are also helpful for law students? Well, um, I mean, since, as, as you've said, um, many or most physical events have been moved, either canceled or moved online, the, the best way is to join the bandwagon and, um, you know, join events online. And whilst you are attending the event online, um, you know, work, um, you know, uh, Tukumbo talk, you know, talked about um, networking. Um, I mean, the, the, uh, the reality is that uh, if, even though events have been moved online, people are still networking um, online. It's, it's not a new thing because we've always, we've always done that um, on LinkedIn. So uh, take advantage of um, the events that are taking place online. And um, if, you, if you've noticed, um, a good number of uh, the events that are taking place online are now free. Whereas if they were uh, held you know, physically in some place, probably they, they would have charged a fee or many people wouldn't have been able to attend because of, you know, um, the, logis the logistics involved in, you know, flying from one place to, to another. So I, I think COVID uh, has presented a unique opportunity to um, young practitioners and students in the sense that they'll be able to attend pretty much any event online, you know, from, from, their, from their bedroom, from their, from their living room. Um, in terms of uh, uh, virtual internships, they are valuable. Um, it's just like an in, it's just like any other internship, and um, I mean in this this summer we've seen um, a number of um, law firms here in London and uh, in the U.S. moving their summer associate um, programs online, and that is as has been counted as work experience. So again, um, the the um, the advantage of a virtual internship is that you don't have to be in London, you don't have to be in The Hague, you don't have to be in New York in order for you to do an internship at um, an organization in The Hague or in New York or in London or in Paris. You can do it pretty much anywhere, even on, 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 on the moon. So COVID has presented a really unique opportunity for young practitioners to learn um, to gain uh, experience and to participate in conferences as attendees or even as, as, as speakers. So I would urge young people to look at COVID um, in a really positive uh, mm -hmm. advantage of the opportunity that it is presenting. So making lemonades out of lemons. Exactly. Yes. So, Tisu, this is your last question. So you studied law in an African country, Malawi. How is it possible to transition into working for an international law firm in London? And how, recept how receptive are law firms to foreign qualifications? Well, um, I'll start with um, foreign qualifications um, in, in, in law firms. I think it really varies uh, for some so some firms are sort of familiar with qualifications from you know, other or certain uh, foreign countries. So if you have or you hold a qualification from one of those countries, it becomes um, a, a, a bit more easy. Um, and then unfortunately, um, some uh, countries are not uh, well known. As a result, uh, their qualifications are not that familiar to, um, to law firms. If you find yourself in that um, category, it, it may be um, a bit harder because they are not, they're just not familiar with, you know, with your qualifications. But that said, um, there are things that there are things that you can do to sort of show that although they may not be fa uh, familiar with your qualifications, but you, you yourself as a person are a good candidate for um, a role um, available at, at the firm. And one, it's gaining experience, what uh, you know, uh, Tukumbo has um, talked about. And then two, um, if you have um, um, a master's degree from um, 
another you know, well-known university because um, I mean the the implication is that uh, you know there's no way you know this second well-known university can accept you if you know your first university is not that good so you know if you do you know these things and then you know the other things is for example if you you know publishing you can you know publish an article again and as as Trumbo, uh pointed out that shows your ability to um to write to draft and to um you know uh, come up in, with an argument and, and defend it and these are the skills that law firms are looking for so if you find yourself in a situation where your qualifications are not very familiar to um, you know, international firms, do things that will make you stand out. So then we say that, okay, he is from you know, Republic of um, Tree, we never heard about it, but he has this, he has this, and she has that, probably she's a good candidate. Um, I, and then the, the, your, your first part was, the first part of the question, oh, sorry, can you just remind me? Yeah, so I, I was asking, how was it possible for you to transition into working in an international law firm? And I think you answered that already. And you talked exactly. about how, yes, yes. And you talked about how receptive international law firms, if you have something to offer, then they would accept you. So you yeah. pretty much answered the question. Yeah, and just to say that I did exactly what I've just said because mm -hmm. I I come from Malawi and not many people know uh, Malawi. It's, it's, a, it's a small it's a small it's a small country. I mean that's that's the reality, you know. So um, you know, I, sometimes I get asked by people it's like, "Oh, where are you from, Malawi?" It's like, "Oh, is that a city somewhere?" You know, it's, like, oh, it's a country. You know? <laughs> yeah. So uh, really, it's just a matter of you know making yourself stand out. So I, I went to, to Dundee and then I went to um, up Harvard Law School. I also did an internship at um, the International Criminal Court. I did a placement at um, Allen and Aubrey. So there's a program called um, International Lawyers for Africa that um, allows uh, young African lawyers to do placements at international firms in London Paris, Dubai, and now Hong Kong. So, you know, when you when you have these extra things, it gives people confidence that uh, probably you have something to offer. But when all you have is um, a degree from University of Malawi, University of Malawi, it's, it's a good university. It's, it's, it's a really good university. But unfortunately, not many people are familiar with University of Malawi. As a result, people may uh, may doubt you. So just just to just to emphasize that uh, if you find yourself in that situation, make sure that you have extras. And these extras, probably, I would say that uh, it's not only for uh, you know those who have graduated from um, universities that are or countries that are not well known. I think for every African student who wants to um, to work in the international law field have something more than your degree because then um, you give people the impression that you have something uh, a little bit more to offer. That was very, very insightful. Thank you, Tissu. So this is the last question because we're almost out of time and this is for talks. So the Hague is said to be the home of international law just as Nuremberg is the center for international criminal law. Would you say relocating there or perhaps other key cities for international law would increase one's chances of getting a desired international law job? So uh, the Hague or Den Haag as it's called, um, you know, it's, it's a lovely city, you know, I work there. Um, but the honest answer is, the answer is no. And I'll tell you why. Because uh, unless you have a job offer, there's no point going to another city. Uh, and let me give you a real life example. I know somebody who's done that. They, they left their, I don't remember where they were from originally, but they relocated to The Hague, hoping to make it somehow. And they've been working in a hotel for the past uh, three years now, still hoping to make you know, that jump somehow. Um, now there's nothing wrong in working in a hotel room. Um, that's not what he wants to do. That's that's the point. So, but 
as we've said, you know, there's still different ways that you can gain experience and take advantage of uh, uh, COVID-19, as Tissy was said, you know, try and use this unique opportunity to leverage, you know, um, opportunities you never had before, networking, the online events, etc., and then take on board everything we've talked about today, you know, build the experience gradually, don't be in a hurry, and once you feel confident, then make those applications, and also make sure you have the academic credentials to back your application, then you make the job um, applications, otherwise, um, you may find yourself in the Hague and, you know, selling fish and chips. Again, I like fish and chips, nothing wrong with it. But if that's not what you want to do, then, you know, don't don't make the jump. Again, you know, it's it's a very expensive city. So make sure that, you know, you're able to afford, uh, you know, the, the jump. That's one thing I'll say as well. Uh, I know I was not asked this question, but I want to add something in terms of the master's degree question, which Tissu um, answered. I also support the idea that you should probably work first before you do your master's degree. And a practical consideration is that uh, unless you have a scholarship, masters are very expensive to, to pursue. So it's also very wise as well to make sure you have money saved up before you do your master's degree as well. So anyway, that's just a final uh, advice that I hope is very helpful to somebody out there. Yes. Thank you so much, Tisu. Thank you so much, Talks. This was a very amazing session. We've come to the end of the panel. I really learned a lot, and I'm sure the audience can see the same too. So it's time for question and answers. I'll just go into the chat box to see what questions the audience have for us. Just a few minutes, please. Audience, please, if you have questions, you can put them in the question box now. Okay, I don't see any questions now. I'll wait for five seconds and see if any questions come in. Please type your questions in the question box. Okay, it seems that our audience don't have any questions. All right, thank you very much, Talks, thank you. Okay, I'm seeing a question now. What if my, this is from Fayinka Abisola. What if my parents can support me? Can I go for a master's degree after my, immediately after my undergrad? Um, if, you know, if you can afford it, that's, that's great. Um, but that being said, you know, uh, just to buttress everything that's been said today, a master's degree in and of itself, uh, will not help you all the way it what it is what it aims to do is to demonstrate that you have a particular specialism in a field of law right but if you don't have the working experience it's all theory so uh go for the master's degree by all means but make sure that you're also trying to get practical experience which you can build up from small organizations as well that's that's the point that i'm trying to thank deliver. you thank and you so much and you know, if I may, if I may, yeah, just, no problem. Um, I mean, when I when I was at, at Harvard Law School, uh, some of my colleagues had um, very little experience, probably the minimum uh, two years experience, and I mean, on top of the two years experience, they had they they gained this you know um, LLM from uh, from um, Harvard Law School. But again, that did not really change, you know, the, the metrics. So as at Humbo said, experience is quite important because uh, a potential employer will definitely look for you. Say, okay, you have a master's, okay, that's fine. But then let's look at your experience. So even if you have a master's from a really great um, university, you know, potential employers will always look for your experience. So your experience is very, very important. Okay, thank you so much. So, so that's a similar question. This person we have is from Cambridge University and he's asking what kind of work experience can we look to gain when these experiences actually require you to have a postgraduate study or have a postgraduate, I mean, degree? Okay, so um, I think 
you have to be very imaginative how you go about it. One, one fact which is not shocking to anybody here is that we have a very competitive um, environment, all right? And if you cannot get opportunities through official channels, use your charm, all right? Approach people and try and offer some type of assistance. I'll give you a practical example. Um, my very first, um, actually, no, what, one, one particular job that, that I had, you know, I had applied through the official channel and I, and I couldn't get the, uh, that job at this. I think I had, this was before I'd graduated from university. And what did I do? I attended a lecture of one of the speakers there and I showed some interest in, in what she was saying, you know, and then I said, listen, if you ever need some type of research assistance, you know, I'm your man. And that was a channel for me to actually get to work in the organization. So use your imagination, basically. Um, you know, there the are many programs you could do, you know, whether it's a virtual internship, whether it's research assistance, whether it's working in a legal clinic, pro bono, et cetera. There are many things you could do. People always need legal assistance. So just open your eyes and be willing to explore. Yeah, thank you, Tux. Um, we can't take all the questions, so I'll just ask one final question. And um, Tisu, I'd like you to answer this. So Courage from AAU Nigeria is asking, I have dreams to work, to work in the UN, but I've been told I must speak two foreign languages, including English. How, how is that a matter of general requirements? Is it something that would increase my chances if I can speak more than one language? Well, um, in the international law field, yes. Um, people are always looking for organizations, even law firms, they're always looking for, uh, you know, people with um, language skills, uh, you know, a good variety of uh, language skills. But that said, uh, not every job will require you to speak in English and, and, and French. So um, if you go, um, you know, on the UN website, there are some jobs, for example, they will, they'll specify that they then they're, they're looking for someone who speaks French and English or just English. So having um, language um, skills, um, a number of language skills, it's good, but it, it obviously you know, um, improves your chances because it means that if you speak English and French, if they are looking for a French speaker, you'll be able to apply for that job. You know? But um, it's, not a, it's not a bar in itself. As we know, there are, you know, there are thousands, if not millions of people who only speak one language, for example, English, working for the UN, uh, working for the, uh, for, the, for the World Bank. So if you can to improve your, um, your employability, as, 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 as Tukumbu said, um, the international law field is very competitive. So if you would want as a way of improving um, or enhancing your employability, you can take up, um, you know, some lessons, you know, French, Arabic, or, uh, or Spanish, for example, when it comes to um, working in uh, law firms in the US, they'll usually look for someone who can speak um, or draft in, um, in Spanish. So do that, 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 that will obviously be uh, a plus, but it's not a bar in itself. Wow, thank you so much. Thank you, Talks. We have thank you, Talks. Thank you, Tisu. We've come to the end of this session. It was really insightful. I'm sorry we could not take all the questions that the audience have put in the chat box, but I'm sure that with this little um, session, the other questions they have have been answered in some way. And the slides that Talks um, prepared have been sent to the audience, and I'm sure most of the um, questions have been answered there. This was truly amazing. Thank you for um, participating, the audience, and thank you for granting um, this opportunity, Talks and Tisu, to speak to us. So once again, thank you very much. Thank We've you. been moving straight to the corporate law session, so please stay tuned. Once again, I'm Joel Olana. Thank you so much for that impactful session. Um, I know everyone will agree with me that they have learned a whole lot. Thank you so much, Mr. Adit Kumba. Thank you so much, Mr. Makato. And thank you, of course, Joel, for driving this conversation skillfully. Um, so at this time, we would go straight into the corporate law session. Um, I would hand over this session to Ms. Abisola Fainka as she would be the moderator for the session.
Thank you very much, Titi Lokwe. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in, for joining us. Good morning, good afternoon, wherever you're listening to us from all over the world. You're welcome to the Corporate Law Panel of Lexus Career Seminar 2020. Before I go on, please can you confirm that you can hear me? Please confirm in the chat box that you can hear me and you can hear everything I'm saying before I, co I continue. Thank you very much. Um, you're welcome once again to the corporate law panel of the Lex Atta Career Seminar 2020. And I, as you, you've heard from um, Titi Lokwe earlier, I have with me an amazing panelist who will be here to share with us um, insightful tips on corporate law and um, projecting and um, working in corporate law after your undergraduate degree. Before I introduce my amazing panelists, please permit me to set some housekeeping rules. Please remember that, you, that after the panel session, we're going to have a question and answer session for all um, where, participants can, um, where participants can ask questions they feel has not been answered during the panel session. Please put your questions in the chat box. Secondly, please show your appreciation and reactions in the chat box so that the panelists can know that you're following us um, as the session progresses. Thank you very much. So I will now move on to introducing my panelists. My amazing panelist is Mrs. Jesu Tofumi Olabenjo. Before um, she comes in, I'd like to read a citation. Mrs. Jesu Tofumi Olabenjo is an experienced senior associate with, with a demonstrated history of working in legal services industry in law firms in Nigeria, California, and London. Our practice areas include oil and gas law, employment law, and general corporate advisory. Just, Ms. Jessica Fumi has a master's of law focused in corporate law, finance, and governance from the prestigious Harvard Law School and a bachelor's of law degree from the University of, from the Lagos State University, pardon me. She was admitted to the Nigerian bar in February 2012 and to the New York State bar in July 2016. Prior to attending Harvard, she practiced civil litigation, arbitration, and intellectual property law with Alukwano Yebode in Lagos, Nigeria. She is passionate about mentoring young lawyers and teaching law. She also enjoys cooking and traveling for leisure in her spare time. With a virtual round of applause, please join me to welcome our amazing panelist, Mrs. Ms. Jessie Tofumi Olabenjo. Thank you very much, um, Abisala, for that uh, introduction. And thanks to the Lex Latter team for organizing this event and for inviting me to speak. I'm pleased to be here. Thank you very much, Ma. It's a pleasure to have you here. Um, so be, without um, further ado, without wasting much of our time, I'd like to go straight into the panel session. So first question, this is something we've all wanted to know, and I also want to know the answer to this question. So first, recognizing the fact that corporate law is very wide, what would you mm -hmm. say law really entails? Okay, thank you for that question. And that's a question that is, um, that is, is, is a long running question in the corporate law world. And I mean, I think I'll start by giving the background that firstly, it is it has been a long running question because um, corporate law, like you've said, is very wide one. And two, there's usually an overlap between what consists of corporate law and what is commercial law. Um, but at the core of it, corporate law practice essentially covers um, all of the rules around uh, business or company formation and operations. So you talk about um, restructuring, shareholder rights, mergers, acquisitions, um, even corporate tax issues, um, joint ventures, um, private equity funding, all of the works really. Um, and like I said, there's usually an overlap with commercial law, which at the core of it deals with commercial transactions. So you have your um, distribution agreements, franchising agreement, um, regular sale contract, and all of the works around commercial activities that the companies would undertake or contractual and commercial activities a company will undertake. Um, thank you very much, ma'am, because you answered two of our questions in one, because I was initially going to ask on the difference between corporate law and commercial law, but thank mm -hmm. you for the two together and us that. Um, Absolutely. I 
question will go down to um, the, the nitty gritties of why you decided to practice corporate law. Why corporate law out of every other area of law that's available? Um, for me, I would say um, I just, I started, I think I recognized that I enjoyed uh, corporate law right from university. Um, so as much as I did several, you know, core courses and elective courses, and I did all the extracurricular activities, in terms of the actual uh, theoretical knowledge that I was getting from school, both in my undergraduate studies and at law school, I would say I enjoyed um, what university, some universities would term as company law, what some universities would term as business organizations um, do most. And to the extent of my knowledge at the time, I found that area of law attractive and interesting. Um, and I got into practice initially doing um, civil litigation or commercial litigation, which is corporate law or com corporate or commercial law, but on the dispute side of it. And I did enjoy that. But at the end of the day, I found myself doing what was my long-term preference of actual core commercial practice from the solicitor side. Okay, Ma, thank you. Um, at least now we know that if we've enjoyed corporate law, then it might be something we want to look out for um, as in practicing later. So to the next question, which is about internships. This is something that most younger undergraduate students have heard over and over and over again on the place mm -hmm. of So I'd like to know from you, what would you say is the place of internships? Also, what, should, what internships should students look out for? And how mm -hmm. can they find out when they're applying for these internships? Okay, so I'll just take each of the, because that's like a four or five part question. So I'll take it in each part. Yes. Um, what is the place of internships? I'll say internships are important. Internships are great. But I would also at the same time not advise that you go to an internship with a, you know, with a closed mind or with a particular objective to learn just about corporate law, especially at the undergraduate level. And the reason is because like the other two speakers, Tokes and Tusi mentioned, at the undergraduate level, I think it's the time to sort of explore and, you know, figure out what areas, you know, what areas even exist. because. From personal um, experience, I realized that a lot of the things I thought I knew about law practice were mostly just theory in university and in practice is a totally different world. So I would advise that yes, internships are important. Yes, look out for internship opportunities. It's okay to say, oh, I think I prefer, for example, um, company law to criminal law. But I would say when you go into the internship, be open-minded. Um, be willing to, you know, apply yourself and experience all of the practice areas that, when I say law firm, if it's a law firm, be willing to experience all of the practice areas that are available in that law firm just to get a sense of what it's like in real life. Um, and that would also help you to be informed as you go along because you, a lot of people find out that through maybe internship experience and realize, oh, maybe they thought they really enjoyed criminal law, but then they find out that they like corporate practice or they like m and because of the way it is actually practiced in real life. So I'll say yes, internships are important, but you know, be open-minded when you go into those internships. Um, please remind me of the other parts of the question. I how to stand out when applying for corporate law internships. Okay, so how to stand out when applying for corporate law internships. Um, I think at the undergraduate level, it's great to have good grades, um, but I would say it's, not, it's also not all about grades. So in your application for an internship, I think the key things that will stand you out are your soft skills. So are you, um, what kind of extracurricular activities do you do? Because those tend to demonstrate the soft skills you have. So whether it's writing skills, whether it's research skills. So for example, do you work with Lex Latter where you undertake research? Because that would translate into some value for the law firm you're trying to offer the organization you're trying to work with or do you have some writing skills that you demonstrate to me through maybe um contributing to your university's law journal for instance because that would that would um, translate into some value that you would bring into the internship so i would say um focus on developing all of those soft skills or do you have some leadership skills or coordinating skills so for instance in your university do you um coordinate I, I coordinate study groups or do you lead or do you work with um, one of the extracurricular organizations in your school because again that translates to the value you would bring as an intern into the organization so i'll say focus on 
or sort of play up all of those strengths in your application and that will be helpful in getting positive consideration for an internship. Thank you for that insightful answer. So to our next question, this is mm -hmm. this focuses on after graduation from your you know, from your undergraduate degree. After okay. the undergraduate degree, would you say that it is necessary to do a postgraduate degree for a corporate law career? Um, again, I think I will also align myself with um, Tokes and Tusi on their points around doing, deciding the right time and the purpose for doing a master's. So yes, um, a master's is great. It's great to have a master's, but um, I think work experience is also very important. And it's important for two reasons. One, work experience at the end of the day is what really determines, you know, how far you go and how much you're able to go. Yes, your master's is important because, hey, you get technical, um, knowledge in that area of specialization that you have chosen to do in your master's. But then for me, I find that it's, it's I typically would advise and I find that um, you have more context and understanding of the purpose for doing a master's if you have some work experience. So from the work experience, you can even, you're even able to determine, okay, what area do I want to specialize in? Or what area do I want to get um, a focus in my master's in and work experience always helps you to get that so work experience plays a dual role of helping you figure out one what exactly you even want to do during the master's and two work experience also even helps you to put that master's experience into context because you get into school there are all these opportunities there are all these classes you're meant to take but the only way or the most beneficial way you can put all of that into context and you know, sort of use that to leverage your career is if you had prior experience working and you understand how to apply all of that knowledge you've gotten. So yes, it's it's a good idea, um, but I think it's also important that you get that work experience. This is absolutely enlightening because I did not know the role that work experience played in helping you achieve your, your greatest goal for your master's. Mm -hmm. um, buttressing on the area of master's, for um, law students who want to go into the um, purely finance area of corporate law, would you advise mm -hmm. an LLM or a master's in finance itself? Um, that's also a very good question. Um, and maybe one last thing I didn't say, or what, one last thing I didn't emphasize on, on the aspect on the area of doing it, whether or not to do a master's and whether or not to do a master's is the fact that a master's degree is actually very expensive. So I think anyone that does one without that knowledge is doing themselves a disservice because you're spending all of this money if you're paying by yourself or even if someone else is paying for you. So even if you've got a scholarship, all of this money is being invested and all of this time because you're taking a year off work and a year of earning is being invested without being equipped to properly undertake the program. Um, that said, is a master's of should you do a master's in corporate law or a master's in finance? Um, I mean, I did a master's in corporate law, but that was for reasons that had to do with my own personal career path. I would, but in, in putting it in context of if you wanted to be purely a finance lawyer, I would advise a master's in finance law. And the reason is really because um, when you're doing an LLM, it's, it's law focused, right? So it's all of the law, law um, theories around financing, right? And then, but if you're doing a master's in finance, it's all of the actual finance concepts. But I think you also need to note that some of those masters require you to have certain experience and certain um, education or knowledge. So if, you, all of, if all of what you've done has nothing to do with finance, it may be difficult to get into those kinds of programs because those programs are more finance focused as against law focus. So you're talking about financial theories, financial modeling, um, raising finance and all of the core finance issues. So I think it's really about what exactly you want to do with the master's degree um, that would help you make an informed decision as to whether to do a master's in corporate law or or whether to do a master's in finance. Okay, thank you very much, ma'am. Um, now we're going back to how wide corporate law is as an area mm -hmm. of law. So would you say it is wise to specialize in one area of corporate law, seeing as there's so many aspects, or is it possible to do them all? 
Okay, that's a really good question. And that's an interesting question. Um, and like you correctly said, corporate law is very wide. So you have corporate lawyers who are very niche and they'll tell you, oh, I only do, um, I only do like target side M&A, for instance. Or, and you have corporate lawyers like me that will tell you I do business advisory and I do several areas of law. So I do oil and gas practice, I will do m and I will do um, your regular general contract. Um, and I think it really depends on what your interests are and what you want to do, especially in a market like Nigeria, um, where a lot of the law firms that offer but that have corporate law practice, you, you typically can do a number of areas as against doing one area. But then if you work in an organization where you know it's niche or the kind of corporate law skills that are required are niche, then you find that you're you know focused on that area and you eventually specialize in that area. So I think it really depends on you know what you want to do and what you like to do. And I think um, from my perspective, I believe that getting law firm experience in the first instance is helpful to help you get a sense of what all of those areas are like and then eventually make a decision on what area or areas you'd like to focus in or specialize in. Mm. So about back to working first to determine the area of law you want to choose before then going for a master's to choose it. Absolutely. Um, okay so to the next question which would be um, the idea that corporate law is separate from litigation and corporate lawyers do not have to go to court and they have mm -hmm. to this is um about that can corporate law be done jointly with litigation because there is a preconceived notion that corporate laws corporate lawyers do not do litigation mm -hmm. okay um thank again thank you for that question that's also a really good question um i think that question also goes back to the issue of specialization right um, and I agree that there's a preconceived notion that, oh, once you do corporate law, you don't have to go to court. Again, I think that depends on your interests and that depends on what you do. Typically, um, for law firms, the way it's organized, it's, they usually would have a distinction between those who do corporate law and those who do litigation. And I think, I believe that's where that misconception has come from. But I think at the end of the day, it depends on the individual because you also have some law firms that have their lawyers do both. In fact, you have um, two, at least two of them come to mind, two um, senior advocates who are, who also are actively involved in corporate uh, law practice. Um, I think it's Professor Elias, SAN, and Professor Konya Jai, SAN. They're both senior advocates. They both go to um, court and they still both do commercial corporate practice. Um, so it's absolutely possible. It's as far as I'm concerned, or the way I see things, um, as far as I'm concerned, nothing is impossible. And at the end of the day, as an individual, you are in charge of your career and you're in charge of defining how you want your career to be. So if you find yourself in a place where you absolutely enjoy corporate law and you absolutely still enjoy doing what we would call commercial litigation side of it, there's nothing stopping you from doing both. I think it's just finding the right balance and finding the right place to express those um, interests. Oh, thank you. So let's let's go a little more into what the students are, um, are um, a lot of fears the students have. So there's yeah. this general problem that so many of undergraduate law students have about not being very good with calculations and mathematics mm -hmm. related um, subjects, which is a problem that many people have, and they don't know whether it's a pre um, it's a prerequisite for being a corporate lawyer. So I'd like to ask if it is required that you have a very good mastery of math mathematics and calculations and all that before you can be a corporate lawyer. Okay, um, thank you for that question. That's actually an interesting question because I hear a lot of people say, oh, I studied law because um, I don't like math and I just didn't want to do anything that had to do with math. Um, so true. <laughs> and it's interesting, I mean, I think, is it, is it compulsory? To the extent you're studying law at the moment, there's a minimum threshold in terms of your mathematical knowledge that's required to get admission into the law programs. So I know in Nigeria, I think you have to have a minimum of a C6 or something, right? Yeah. Um, and I think armed, armed with that, you are able to excel as a corporate lawyer. So is it important to have mathematical knowledge? Yes. To what extent is that knowledge required? 
um, it's not, I mean, it's not to a massive extent. So nobody's expecting you to say maybe on an MA deal, you're not expected to do like all of the financial modeling or calculating what the value of the company is or, you know, doing all the financial structure, you know, um, that is absolutely not expected of you because in that kind of scenario, you're working with other professionals. So you're working with financial advisors, you're typically working with tax advisors as well, who it is their primary duty to undertake those um, tasks. But at the end of the day, to the extent that you're working on that transaction, you need to sort of have a basic, I mean, the most basic knowledge of what is going on, right? So even if you don't know the actual one plus one, I mean, even if you don't know the actual numbers, you need to have a basic knowledge of the logical like flow of whatever it is you're being presented with because most times you are charged with the duty of sort of representing some of these things into words by your drafting and so the only way you can do that successfully is to at least have a basic knowledge of what they're trying to express so if someone tells you oh i'm trying to buy 40 percent of this company at the very least you should be able to figure out what 40 percent of the company is right or if um and i'll give a personal example so i've had an instance where I had told the client the fees for, for something, and this was really basic. I, I told the client the fees for something was X percent, right? So the client comes back to me with his interpretation of what X percent was. But then looking at it, I was like, no, absolutely, X percent cannot be this. It has to be this number. And so I went back to him and I was like, oh, thank you for pointing that out. You know, little things like that, you know. So in, to that extent, I would say it's, it's, it's important to have the knowledge, but it's not, you know, a make or break type. I've heard our ladies and gentlemen, only the basics is required. So no math or no math, you can practice corporate law. You are fine, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so another question that is on the mind of most people, would you mm -hmm. say a corporate law career is very lucrative? Because, you know, most times when people hear, oh, I'm a corporate lawyer, the first thing that comes to their mind is money. Is this mm -hmm. true? <sighs> that is a good question. I would, I would say it's as lucrative as any other, um, as any other um, legal rule, really. Um, definitely more lucrative if you're doing it outside of a law firm. So if you're doing it in-house in an organization or in a private equity firm, definitely um, it's, it's more lucrative there. But it's, it's equally as fair in a law firm you know especially if you are if you find yourself in one of the bigger corporate law firms it definitely is is a good option from a pay perspective yeah <laughs> all right then thank you very much for that answer so last um second to the last question um okay. what what would you say is the place of technology and digital skills in the practice of corporate law in nigeria or even outside nigeria Okay, um, the place of digital skills and technology, I would say technology is important because, I mean, that is what facilitates all of the work you do. Um, so at the most basic level, you should be able to um, find your way around the internet. You should be able to find your way around all of the MS Office applications, so Word, Excel, PowerPoint, because a lot of the work you do you need to um, express it through those applications. Um, and then you also, I mean, as things begin to advance, you find that law firms or lawyers or your corporate work also involves the use of like special, specially developed technology for lawyers. And you sort of need to have an understanding of how those work. But then the only way you can understand how those work is if you at least have a basic knowledge of how you know, technology works. So I, I would say it's important. And I would say um, it's important that people just keep up with technological advancements so that you are on top of your game from that perspective. Okay, thank you very yeah. much for that insightful answer. Last but not the least, I know that everybody's holding their jotters now and they're waiting for the one advice you're going to give to all of them um, on, how, um, on how to work it for them to practice corporate law. So what advice do you have for undergraduates all over the world who are listening now who mm -hmm. want interested in the practice of corporate law? Um, for an undergraduate interested in practice of corporate law, at this point in time, I would say um, focus on building a foundation. So 
and what does that foundation entail? So in university, you're getting, you're taking all of these classes that are corporate law related. So you have your contracts, you have your uh, real estate, you have your company law. So focus in just, your focus should be on just getting a good understanding of all of those basic concepts in all of those kinds of courses, because at the end of the day, all of those concepts will be things you face with on a day to day basis as a corporate lawyer. And you'll be assumed at that point that you'll have an understanding of what those things entail. So in that regard, I would say focus on all of those um, kinds of courses and the basic concepts. Um, from a soft skills perspective, I would say also focus on you know, building all of your soft skills. So is it leadership, um, emotional intelligence, um, just general etiquette, you know, how do you, how do you um, conduct yourself in an office environment? And I think you also get, you can also get that knowledge from doing internships. So how do you even send emails? How do you communicate in a work environment? Because it's totally different from, you know, your regular social environment. Um, or how do you even dress to work? You know, how do you present yourself at meetings? How do you, you know, conduct yourself at meetings? Because as a corporate lawyer, I also attend a lot of meetings, attend a lot of negotiations. So how do you talk to people? How are you able to negotiate um, points amicably without being rude or without being condescending? So it's all of those soft skills as well. I would say focus on building that such that whatever, wherever you will find yourself as a lawyer, whether it's corporate law or outside of corporate law, those skills would always come in useful. Um, and I think the last point is just try and be um, aware. So be commercially aware because as a corporate lawyer as well, you need to be, um, in addition to just your regular or advising the client on what the law actually says or drafting agreements, you also need to be a commercially aware person. So what is going on from a legislative development standpoint? What rules have, for instance, CBM passed that impacts your client's business? You need to be aware of those things. What does your client even do? Because at the end of the day, even though you are a lawyer, you need to have a basic understanding of what your client does as a business because that's the best, that's the only way you can provide them with advice that is useful. So at the university level, just be commercially aware someone is talking about, oh, shop price is leaving Nigeria, for instance, you know, what, what, what does that mean? Like, how does that impact the market? What does that mean for the economy? You know, things like that. So I would say that is useful. Internships as well are useful. Writing articles, publishing articles as well, very useful. Um, and with all of that, I think you should be able to build a good foundation to excel in corporate law or in any other area of law. Oh, Thank you very much, Ma. I hope you've all, uh, please focus on getting the foundation and getting the basics. Mm -hmm. And now that we're done with the panel session, we're down to the part where you've all been waiting for. So Ma'am, we have quite a number of questions already available in the um, chat box and we'll take, we'll take um, most of them um, mm -hmm. as much as our time permits. So please, if you've not put your question in the chat box, please go ahead and do so now so that we can be able to take your questions and it doesn't um, exceed the time that we are already allocated. So first question is from Ayomiko from the University of Lagos, Nigeria. Being a practicing mm -hmm. lawyer, would you advise one to get the ICSAN certification and what other certification and skills do you think would be needed to stand out in the corporate field? Okay, um, that's a good question. Uh, but I think, like I had mentioned earlier, certifications are great. They're good, there's no doubt about that. Cause I mean, a certification essentially says, look, this person has specialized knowledge in this area. So whether it's ICSAN, which is your secretaries and administrations um, certification, or whether it's your CITN, which is for tax, or whether it's your ACR, which is for arbitration, it essentially says Look, this person has undergone these studies in this specific area, and the person has those skills. But the truth is, if you have never, for instance, if you have the ICSAN and you've never been to a board meeting, then it doesn't really, it doesn't really um, hold a lot of water in terms of, you know, giving someone else confidence, confidence in your abilities as a secretary and administrator, for instance. So I would say, um, if you're absolutely sure that it's an area that you're interested in, it's great to get that certification, but also 
importantly, I think it's also important to get experience in that area. So whether you're doing company secretaries work, um, which would help you get experience in that area. So you're able to sort of justify the certification you have. Okay, thank you very much. Um, the next question is from a student of the Nigerian Law School in Nigeria, Ms. M. Zulu, and she says, given that corporate company law is for the most part spe um, specific to a country, would it mm -hmm. be wise to do a, a master's in Nigeria or abroad? Hmm. Um, that is an interesting question, but I think I'd like to correct the fact that the fact around the company law being specific to a country. Um, so yes, I mean, you, you can say that maybe the laws in terms of the core company's law would differ in Nigeria and in the US and in um, South Africa, for instance. But in terms of the core um, concepts, I think they're pretty much similar around um, jurisdictions, especially um, jurisdictions with similar um, law history. So for instance, in common law jurisdictions, the core corporate law concept or core company law concepts are largely similar. So I don't think that necessarily impacts on where you should choose to do your master's, right? So even though the actual legisl legislations might be different in terms of how far or how wide or how much they offer, the core concepts are largely the same. So it's the same thing, Nigeria, the US, the UK, South Africa, largely the same thing. Um, so I think the decision as to where um, can be inspired by other things and not necessarily the fact that the law is different. So decision as to where is really about different things, what you can afford, um, what you're looking to do with the masters, how much time you can even take off work. Because for some people, because they're not able to take off time to go abroad, they just decide to do a part-time masters in Nigeria. So it really depends on you and you know what you seek to or how you're able to accommodate each option, really. Okay, ma. Um, thank you. So this is something you earlier spoke about, but I think the person was not clear, so more clarity will be appreciated. So this okay. is from Achioya from the university, from Uniben, Nigeria. Okay. Is there a relationship between corporate and business law? Yes, so like I explained earlier, um, there sort of is, an overlap between both, especially um, in Nigeria or in law firms where there isn't a lot of distinction between both practice areas, because you find that um, with corporate law, like I said, it's more about the rules around formation and operation of companies. So your mergers and acquisitions, your um, financing, your securities law and things like that. But then your commercial law, what you call your business law, is more around um, those business transactions that the company undertakes. So X company wants to enter into a distribution agreement with Y company, right? That is what um, or that, that's what you classify as um, commercial law. And so going to the question, is there a relationship? In the grand scheme of things, I'll say yes, because it's usually a lot of overlap. So you have, you find that even in your um, in the cause of maybe advising a company on a, what you term a core corporate deal, a core corporate transaction, um, you find that sometimes the output of that would involve advising on the commercial side of things. So it's really, you know, they're largely interrelated. Okay, thank you. I hope that answered the question. Yes, it did. Thank you. Thank you very much for the clarification. Um, Emanuela, I hope you got your answer. So we have another question from Ayomikun from the University mm -hmm. of Nigeria. He says, is there is commercial awareness a necessity for corporate law and governance? If yes, what mediums do you, re do you use to remain commercially aware? Thank you. That's a really good question. Um, and the answer to that is yes, 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 yes. Absolutely, yes. Commercial awareness is very, very, very important to corporate law and governance. And I'll use an example to explain why. So um, you can't, you can't, as a lawyer, you're, yes, you're, you know your technical legal knowledge, right? You know your 
what to draft, you know what the law says, you know what the rule says, but you're helping a client achieve a business objective, right? And at every point in time, the client is focused on achieving that business objective. The only way you can sort of marry what you know in terms of your technical knowledge and the client's business objective is, be, is to be commercially aware. So that's sort of like the link between helping your clients achieve their goals and you know, making sure they're doing it in line with what the law requires, right? And so um, it's about knowing what your client's business does, you know, knowing what your client's business objectives are. It's about knowing you know, what is going on in the economy. So um, I see that he asked what mediums do I use to remain commercially aware? So, um, there's something in the news about a new CBM regulation, for instance. I'm looking at this because I have clients that are governed by the CBM and I need to know what is in that rule. What does that rule mean for my client's business? What does that rule mean for the future of my client's transaction, for instance? You know, So I would read those kind of things. Um, I would listen to the news and not just local news like Nigerian news. I would also listen to international news as well. And that's because you have, um, you would have clients who are coming from all over the world. And sometimes it's also helpful to like communicate and relate with them when you can show, when you can demonstrate that you understand exactly what they do and the environment in which they operate. And the only way you can know that is if you're commercially aware. So are you, um, listening to so for instance i would read like um new york times i read stairs um, a lot i read naira metrics a lot as well i would listen to the news as well so your regular cnn your channels um because from all of those um sources you get a lot of information about things that are going on around you and you find that a lot of the times your clients are relying on you for that knowledge so besides knowing that you're good at law they want to know do you know about the economy you could operate in do you know how we are going to fit into this economy? So um, I think it's, it's absolutely, absolutely important to be commercially aware. Thank you very much, Ms. Jessica Tofumiola Benjo. It has You're been welcome. a pleasure listening to you and I promise you that we've learned a lot. I, I personally have gained so much in, mm -hmm. in, in my plan to practice corporate law in future. Thank you very much to all our listeners all over the world. Thank you for tuning in. Thank you for staying with us. I remain Fainka Abisola Tewalade. Please join us in our next session, which is the arbitration session. Thank you. We have now come Thank you for having me. Thank you so much, Ms. Jessica Tofumi Olavenjo, for this insightful session on corporate law. I have learned a whole lot, and I'm pretty sure the um, participants have learned too. Um, if you've learned a lot like I have, please let us know in the comment section so that you know we understand that you're really learning during this time. Um, I'd like to thank the moderator, Abisola Fainka. You did an excellent job. Thank you for you know skillfully steering this conversation. Um, now we'll be going on a break for five minutes. Please do not go anywhere. Um, you can, at this time, you can um, take a bathroom break. You can, you know, grab something to drink, water or anything you want to have to drink. You can also network with your fellow participants with the chat box. Um, and also, yes, you can use this time to post about your experience at the Lex Lata Career Seminar on Instagram and LinkedIn. Use the hashtag Lex Lata Career Seminar and you can tag us and we'll put the details of our center in the comment section so that you can tag us. Um, yeah, so thank you all and see you very soon. We'll return at... Um, please excuse me. We'll return at exactly 1.55 p.m. Thank you.
Um, our break is now over and without further ado, can everyone hear me just to be sure? And before I continue. <laughs> Okay, thank you very much. So our break is now over and without further ado, we'll be moving straight into the last panel session for the day, which is arbitration. Our panelists are already here, I can see them. And so at this time, I will hand over to our moderator, Miss Veronica Aino, to kick off the session. Thank you. Good afternoon or good morning to all our participants, wherever you're tuning in from. I hope you enjoyed the two previous sessions. Please, if you can hear me, let me know in the chat box. Okay, great. Welcome to the arbitration panel session for the 2020 Lex Latter Career Seminar. I am Veronica I know. I am a graduate student at the Nigerian Law School and I will be moderating the arbitration panel session. I'm super excited about this session and I can't wait to learn from both our guests, Tolu Obamura and Chizara Uzadima. Hello Tolu, how are you doing today? Okay, I think we lost Mr. Tolu there. Chizaram, hi Chizaram, how are you doing today? I'm fine, thank you, Veronica. How are you doing? I'm very well, thank you too. Great. So I would read the profile of our guests before we proceed to the panel discussion. Tolu Obamuro is an associate in the International Arbitration Group at White and Case LLP Paris. His practice includes international commercial and investment arbitration. Prior to joining White and Case, Tolu was the Associate General Counsel at the Lagos Court of Arbitration, where he was responsible for case management and dispute resolution of the court. He has also worked in a commercial firm in Nigeria, doing, during which time he was involved in high profile transactions in Nigeria. Tolu was recently co-chair of Young ICCA, International Council for Commercial Arbitration. He was named the rising star in the rising star category 40 under 40 of the Nigerian Legal Awards in 2016 and 2018, and a recipient of the Africa's 50 Most Promising Young Arbitration Practitioners 2020 Award by the Association of Young Arbitrators, AYA Africa. Tolu received his LLM from Columbia Law School, his BL from the Nigerian Law School, and his LLB from Obafemi Awolowo University. Join me in welcoming Tolu Obamuro with a virtual round of applause by putting hashtag Tolu in the chat box. Thanks for having me. Welcome again, Mr. Tolu. Thank you guys for welcoming him. Shizaram Uzodima is a legal practitioner specializing in international arbitration. She was caught in Nigerian bar in November 2016 and began her legal career as a trainee associate at SPA Ajibadi and Co, Lagos, Nigeria, where she worked primarily with the dispute resolution practice group of the firm. Thereafter, she joined ALEX Legal Practitioners and Arbitrators, Lagos, Nigeria where she worked as an associate in the dispute resolution practice group of the firm. She regularly represented and advised clients on matters relating to labor and employment, contracts, corporate law, regulatory compliance, commercial litigation, primarily ad hoc domestic arbitrations, and alternative dispute resolution. Chizaram is an active member of the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators, UK, Nigerian branch, and the ICC YAF, Young ICCA, the African Arbitrators Association, and the Association of Swiss Arbitrators, ASA Below 40. She has authored and co-authored several articles and case reviews on arbitration published on Lexology, Mondac, and professional associations blogs. 
She was part of the team that represented SPA, Ajibade and Co. in the maiden edition of the Lagos Court of Arbitrator, Arbitration Young Arbitrators Network, LCA Yan International Moot, Moot, International Commercial Arbitration Moot Competition in 2007. She was also part of the team that represented Alex in the second edition of the LCA Yan Competition 2018, where the firm emerged winner. Chizaram is currently undertaking the reputable Geneva LLM in International Dispute Settlement, MIDS program, where she takes advanced courses on international commercial arbitration, investment arbitration, and other forms of public and private international dispute settlement mechanisms. A virtual round of applause for Chizaram by putting hashtag Chizaram in the chat box. Welcome once again, Chizara. Thank you very much, Veronica. It's an honor to be here. And it's also an honor to share the panel with one of my mentors in the field, Tolu. Nice to meet you again, Tolu. Yeah, thank you. Before we jump right into the panel session, I would like our guests to tell us a fun fact about themselves. Chizara, let's start with you. Sorry, I didn't get your question. A fun fact about you. Oh, a fun fact about me. Um, I love to draw. I draw and I paint, but mostly pencil drawing. I went commercial with it at one point, but now I'm a full-time lawyer and I do it as a hobby where I love to draw. Interesting. Interesting fun facts we've got there. So Lou, um, kindly unmute your microphone and tell us a fun fact about you. Um, okay. What? Maybe um, I, I iron my shirts after getting them back from the dry cleaner. Oh, <laughs> interesting fun facts we've got there. So in the spirit of fun facts, it will interest you all to know that I have interned at Alex, Babalaki and Co, and White and Case, and I'm a member of the Lagos Court of Arbitration all of which appear on the profiles of both our guests. So it's a huge privilege moderating this panel session. Yes, so that's a fun fact about me. Now to why we are all here. Arbitration is a very interesting field and I find it exciting to see law students in Nigeria and abroad develop their interest in this area. However, a lot of students are clueless as to the prospects of practicing arbitration both locally and internationally. Before I proceed into the panel session, students, please be reminded that you should state your name and the country from which you are tuning in if it doesn't already appear as your Zoom name before asking your questions when they come up in the course of the panel session. And we encourage you to ask your questions in the chat box, even while the panel session is going on. We will be addressing the questions from the chat box for 10 minutes right after the panel discussion. So the first question which I will be asking goes to Tolu. Tolu, please can you tell us how international arbitration is different from arbitration in general? Right, can you hear me now? Yes, loud and clear. Yeah, okay, um, so uh, once again, uh, thank you for having me. Um, to start with arbitration itself, it's, um, it's a concession means of resolving uh, disputes, uh, whereby uh, parties uh, submit uh, their disputes to a private uh, adjudicatory process um, which um, afford parties to present their case. And of course, at the end of the day, the tribunal or the arbitrator renders uh, a binding decision in the form of award. Um, international arbitration obviously has some international elements to it. Um, international because it involves parties in uh, two or multiple jurisdictions. And, and that is different from domestic arbitration where the parties are based in the same jurisdiction. Um, and so um, a lot of, in a lot of countries, the same law regulates both domestic and international arbitration, but 
they may have a carve out section that address specifically international arbitration. For example, the Nigerian Arbitration and Conciliation Act uh, regulates both um, commercial, uh, I mean, uh, international and domestic arbitration in Nigeria. Uh, but part three of the ACA, uh, the Arbitration and Con uh, Conciliation Act, specifically addresses um, international arbitration. Uh, and the last thing I would say uh, with regards to international arbitration, it's um, what makes um, arbitration really effective is the efficient system is the New York Convention, uh, which has been ratified by 165 countries. Uh, I think Ethiopia was the, 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 the last to ratify sometime last week. And, um, but that uh, convention, which is the most successful United Nations Convention only applies to international arbitration. It does not apply to domestic arbitration. I hope that answers your question. Yes, thank you very much, Mr. Solu, for that important distinction between arbitration generally and international arbitration. So I'll be moving on to Chizaram. Chizaram, we would love to know, how did you develop your interest in arbitration? Thank you once again. Um, I like to consider myself one of the very lucky few that had a hint of what she wanted to do as at the first year of um, undergrad. And I picked up interest in arbitration when I was um, asked to write a term paper. By the way, I went to the University of Nigeria in Suka, so if you don't know that. I picked up interest in arbitration when I was asked to write a, a term paper on ADR generally. So of course, I researched on various types of ADR, mediation, conciliation, negotiation, and arbitration. Now, I was scared of doing litigation. I, I wanted to be a lawyer, but I wasn't so sure I wanted to do litigation. So it was just a bit interesting to see and to know that there was some kind of um, dispute resolution mechanism that could um, help clients or parties settle their disputes out of court and the binding manner and an enforceable manner. So that was the first time I picked up interest in arbitration in my first, in my first year of um, um, university. And then fortunately we took arbitration um, as um, a fourth year course, um, penultimate year. So I took it as an elective course. And there again, I don't know if we have University of Nigeria um, students in, 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 the, in the audience, but you would know um, um, Barista Lauren Femi. So he taught um, arbitration and he did it very well. Also, um, I've forgotten the name, the name of the next lecturer that also taught it. But yes, they, they, they helped me to understand arbitration more, both domestic and international. And it was at that point I decided I was going to write my undergraduate and thesis topic on something relating to arbitration. So I already had a hint of, I picked up interest in arbitration as at my first year of um, undergrad. Thank you very much, Zara, for explaining how you um, developed your interest. And interestingly, you were able to decide early that you wanted to go into arbitration, which a lot of us do not have. You know, a lot of us do still are still confused about what to do and what not to do. But interesting there. So um, the next question I would also like to ask you, Chizaram, is how did you how did your journey to becoming an international arbitrator begin? Okay, yes, I just want to um, um, clarify, I did not decide at that point that I wanted to develop a career in arbitration. Oh, I picked up okay. interest in arbitration at that point. So I, of course, I, I was still learning new things. I was just a fresh student, law student. So there was so much to learn, so much to know. Um, how did my journey to becoming an arbitration practitioner um, begin? Yes, I picked up interest in arbitration, but I think it really began in law school when I decided to take the um, Chartered Institute of Arbitrators um, entry course and become an associate of the of the um, of the institute. So that was where my, of course, I had written my thesis on something related to to arbitration, but I hadn't decided at that point that I wanted to pursue a full um, full time career in arbitration. 
But at the point when I took my um, the entry course into um, the Chartered Institute of, Arbit of Arbitrators UK in Nigeria, as at 2016 during my law school, um, I took the course and I got inducted into the um, into the institute. And I think at that point, I my 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 career, so to speak, as an arbitration practitioner. Um, began. I, I like to use the word arbitration practitioner because arbitrator is somebody who sits and decides the disputes and I haven't gotten there yet. So as an arbitration practitioner, it began when in 2016 when I took um, the, 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 the course, the entry course into the Institute of Arbitrators. Yeah, that's, that's how it began. Okay, thank you once again. Shizara, so um, since we are, you spoke about the, a particular course you did with the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators UK, I would like to ask this follow-up question to that. Um, does being an arbitration practitioner require any special qualification besides a degree? And if yes, what are these certifications or qualifications? I know you already mentioned one that's the certification by the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators. So what other qualifications would you advise or which ones do you have that's impacted your career? Is that question for me? Yes, yeah, for you, Chizara. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, I don't think any particular degree is necessary to become an arbitration practitioner. And um, the previous panels on international law and also corporate law, they spoke, uh, especially the international law panel, they spoke a lot about experience. I think what's really important is getting some kind of um, experience as well, rather than uh, if focus on a particular degree. So, but, but it does help to um, it's beneficial, not necessary, but beneficial to 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 take courses and also, um, of course, gain some kind of experience like an internship. But courses like the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators entry course is helpful. I think the um, LCA is also holding some courses. I don't know if that course. I don't think it applies to undergrads. I think it's for um, um, graduates who are entering new into the into into arbitration practice. But yes, the 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 Chartered Institute of Arbitrators um, course is the one I used and which was beneficial to me in basically kickstarting um, my career in international arbitration. But you don't have always, it doesn't always have to be a course. It could also be a seminar. It could be a webinar. It could be anything that could help you to just gain more knowledge about arbitration, which will be, which would suffice to really start up um, building a career in that field. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. So um, for some seconds, we lost Mr. Tolu. Hello, Tolu, are you back? Yeah, I, I'm back. I'm, I'm sorry. I apologize. My hi to you guys are a bit messy. No problem. Things. No problem. Welcome back. So um, we were talking about qualifications and certifications that you might need to qualify as an arbitrator. And Chizaram all, already mentioned a few. She said you could try to um, gain experience and also um, undergo trainings. So um, what other trainings or certifications do you think are important to for someone who aspires to be an arbitration practitioner like you? Um, yeah, uh, so I think, um, you know, it's, um, first of all, as undergraduates, uh, I think of what's useful for you. It's, um, uh, you have to pay uh, close attention to um, uh, your contract law, it's, it's extremely important because it's sort of the foundation for um, international commercial arbitration. Um, and of course, if you take the elective, I'm not sure if it's compulsory course in a lot of schools, but if it's compulsory, uh, of course you all do it, but if it's uh, an elective, but you're interested in international arbitration, I would say, uh, consider taking international law. Um, because it gives you the, the basics um, that you build on um, in your career. So as, as students, that, that will really be uh, my recommendation uh, to start with. And in terms of arbitration itself, um, the trainings are good. Uh, 
the only hesitation I have about training generally, it's because if you're interested in international arbitration, it's quite sophisticated. Uh, it's, it's, it requires a lot. And if you, not many people who administer some of these trainings um, have done arbitration at, at the highest level and sort of um, have the, you know, the sophistication that it's, it's sort of required to make, um, you know, a world-class career out of that. So my recommendation is always, uh, it's good to take trainings, and, but it's, it's just as a stepping stone and um, for you to build on. Uh, and your main competence, you, the skills, the knowledge that you require to excel in the field of international arbitration, uh, you only acquire that working, doing the work of what we actually do. Um, and that's why a lot of law firms like Whiting Case, for example, um, we hardly hire people who have not gone through our internship program. We always hire directly from our internship program because that's where you get your hand really dirty. That's where you do the, the grunt work of knowing exactly what we do, the tools that we use, and um, our method and approach to international arbitration. So um, trainings are good, um, but it's just stepping stone uh, to building um, a career. One thing that is also useful is if you happen to work in a law firm where you practice litigation, um, it's a useful tool for you because those skills um, are things you're going to build up. So you don't have to start your career working in, in a, you know, as international arbitration lawyer. I didn't start mine as international arbitration lawyer. I started as a litigation uh, lawyer. Uh, Chizaram started as a litigation lawyer. Um, but the skill set and, and the approach that you take, it's, it's the same. It's similar in a lot of ways. And so, and that's what's going to be uh, your springboard to building a career in the uh, in the field of international arbitration. Thank you very much, Tulu, for that insightful answer. So, in when you were speaking, you mentioned something about um, getting a job with White and Case and how you know you transitioned from your internship at White and Case. So, I have two questions from this. The first is, what does it take to work? with the International Arbitration Group of White and Case. And I'm very sure a lot of our audience are also um, wondering, how do you get an internship with White and Case? Um, so, can you hear me? Very can well. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. So uh, typically, um, because it's very competitive process, um, you can imagine that we the kind of candidates that we uh, that comes to us they are usually the top of the class um, from all over the world uh, most of them uh, they've done internship in other places um, a lot of them speak two three four five languages um, and um, some of them they've they've practiced litigation somewhere uh, for one two years before they have LLM not all of them have LLM because uh, some of them schooled in, 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 in Europe where uh, the educational system, the structure, I mean, when you, once you go through that system and you come out, you, you don't immediately want to pursue an LLM. But um, yeah, that's the profile, the typical profile of people um, that, uh, that come to us for internship. Um, but beyond that, uh, because what we do is, is it's quite difficult. We, we live quite a difficult life uh, because we work all the time. Um, so I'm particularly, I look out for people who make my life easier. Um, yeah, you have to be easy to work with. Uh, you have to have a, a good command of language. Uh, when any language is a tool of a trade, especially English language, uh, being able to write well, I mean, not perfectly, but decently. Uh, you know, your email etiquettes and all of those stuff. You are going to learn a lot of, of that here, but um, that's it. Uh, it's, it's also a starting point. You need to know that there's something there that you can build on uh, before um, you maybe consider for a place here. And, and of course, just have a good network uh, because you, as it happens most often, somebody, you send your CV to somebody, then they, they process it within the system and then they get back to you. So 
and that's how it works. So um, yeah, that's that's what it takes, I think. I'm not sure if it's so straightforward, but um, I try as much as possible to, to help, yeah. Yeah, thank you, thank you very much. So um, we'll move on to the next question, which is also on you know getting international opportunities in arbitration. Please, around this question is for you. How best can an undergraduate law student position themselves for international opportunities in arbitration? Okay, for international opportunities in arbitration. Um, I think the first thing would be to intern in a good firm that practices arbitration in Nigeria. As an undergraduate law student, you shouldn't um, neglect any opportunity you get to have some kind of experience. So you can target good firms that practice arbitration. And then from there, you can actually see which lawyer is working on some international arbitration case and offer to do research, offer to do anything to help in the drafting, offer to um, maybe review to correct footnotes, just try to get yourself in. But the first thing is to even get, to, to be in that position where you can offer help. And one of the ways to do that is to um, join a firm as an intern that does arbitration and then offer your services. Then I think another way you could do that is just first focus on graduates, <laughs> graduate with good grades. Because once you do that, you become like, it's easier for you to get um, to top firms that are looking for, um, for, for, for good talent. And once you're able to get into a top firm, then you can even be an associate, not just an intern in those firms and do substantive international arbitration work. A third way would also is closely connected and um, connected to graduating first with, with good grades would be to do your master's. I took that um, route. I was mostly involved with domestic arbitration. Before I came um, for my master's here in Switzerland, I was mostly involved in domestic arbitration and it, made, it majorly related to enforcement of domestic awards. So it was still arbitration mixed with a little bit of litigation because of course you have to go to the courts to enforce awards. But when I decided to come for my master's, I was exposed to the international field. And then I, I am currently doing my internship in a law firm here in Switzerland, and I'm exposed to more and more international arbitration cases. So I think these are the three ways for you to do it as an, as an undergraduate. The first would be to, you can start now by applying to law firms in Nigeria that do arbitration. Alex, where I work is a good example. I'm not, I'm not, I'm, I'm not being sponsored to, to, to advertise for them, but I, I, I worked in ALEC, so I can say, I can talk based on experience. They are very good at arbitration. Then you could also just finish your, um, your, your, your undergrad, graduate, and then still apply as an associate in those firms or, or do your master's. That's, that's it. Thank you very much, Zaram, for that insightful answer and for you know, giving us the three major pointers get good grades, get rental, and then you could go further to do an LLM. So speaking of LLM, let's, let's talk about LLM. We know that both our panelists have LLM experiences from foreign jurisdictions. So how different would you say is the education of arbitration in foreign countries compared to Nigeria? And in what countries or jurisdictions would you advise students interested in arbitration to pursue an LLM. So Lou, let's start with you. Um, so Lou, your microphone is muted. Hello, can you hear me now? Yes, loud and clear. Okay. okay. And um, you're asking about the uh, how education. LLM, 
LLM program in Nigeria is, I mean, in foreign jurisdiction is different from Nigeria, right? First of all, um, when I was doing my LLM, I felt it was a waste of my time. Um, because it, they were not really teaching me law, so to speak. Uh, like, they were not teaching me things that I, I felt like I didn't know at that time. But it's, it was later on down, you know, almost towards the end that I realized that uh, what had changed. And that's because the system of instruction is different. Um, the emphasis on research, the opportunities, the kind of people that you're exposed to uh, during your LLM program, it's really, really significant. And you don't know the impact of that on your career because most of the people that I, uh, I work with or you know, still um, relate with professionally, I met them in the course of my LLM program. So that's really what's different. Uh, but in terms of the content itself, the content is it's the same. The method for passing on instruction is different. You go to class, uh, you don't expect somebody to come and teach it to you. Uh, it's a Socratic method, in, 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 uh, mostly in, in, in developed uh, jurisdiction, especially in the US. So you go to class, you'll be ready to talk, you'll be ready to present, uh, and you'll be ready to answer questions. Uh, so that's really uh, what's different. Uh, and yes. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, you did, but we would also like to know in what jurisdictions you would advise students to, you know, look for an LLM in international arbitration or just arbitration generally. Uh, yeah, um, I think the U.S. The U.S. is good. Um, I mean, not because there's so much arbitration going on there in terms of uh, sitting arbitration in the U.S., but. They have very good school, the top schools where you want to train. Um, of course, I'm going to tell you Columbia is number one. Um, uh, and you have Harvard Law School, uh, Yale, and all those places where not just the program itself, but the, the quality of instruction. Uh, if you go to Columbia, for example, you're going to meet George Berman, you're going to be, meet uh, Smith. Uh, if you go to Harvard, you have those top people in, in UPenn, you have, you know, Catherine and different people like that. And these are the big shots in international arbitration. So that, that's useful. Uh, in the UK, um, you know, the top schools in the UK, uh, uh, Queen Mary, for example, they have a fantastic program, a, a very good um, faculty as well. And of course, MEADS, I mean, MEADS program, it's, um, if you really want to get into it, especially invest, investment arbitration, ICDS, um, it's the MEADS. Uh, and the reason why the MEADS is the MEADS is because you have the sort of managed to bring uh, the top shot from all over the world uh, to get out to teaching classes. I'm sure she's around will be able to tell you more of the people um, uh, who taught her in school. Uh, these are the best in the game. So uh, again, but they are not cheap. Uh, LLMs generally are not cheap. Uh, so you have to make a strategic decision between going to a good school, and, uh, I mean, a strategic balance between going to a good school and also keeping, staying within budget. Um, because by the time you graduate from school, you will see that you have bill in, uh, in thousands uh, of uh, dollars or euros. So uh, th those are the considerations, but all the, the top schools in, in, in Europe, in America, and especially the NEETS uh, program, uh, it's, it's uh, very good. Uh, yeah. Thank you very much Tolu for that insightful answer. Chizaram, would you like to add anything to what Olu has said? Yes, uh, and it's it's a bit um, um interesting because when I was making trying to make a decision to um, go for my masters, I Tolu was one of the people I consulted, and it's just nice to hear some of the advice he gave me then, seeing him saying it now. But yes, I totally agree with um, everything Tolu has said. But um, I also want to add that. For me, it's going to be difficult to, that's relating to the first part of the question, which is, um, I think, how does an LLM, a foreign LLM compare with um, LLM in, in Nigeria, right? That was, the, that was the first part of your question. 
Yes, yes. So for me, it's difficult to make that comparison because when I did arbitration, the formal education of arbitration I had in Nigeria was um, as an undergraduate in my fourth year. And it was more of like an overview of arbitration. So I wouldn't consider it a worthy, um, uh, a worthy thing to compare with the with an intensive masters in an in arbitration or something arbitration related. But what I would say is peculiar about um, a foreign LLM, or let me just speak for myself, um, the MEETS program, is that you get to learn with people from various backgrounds and with various um, professional profiles. So you have, um, in my class, I had um, uh, a, a former judge in North Korea as a student. So it's, it's just interesting to, to know people, people come with various, a, a broad range of um, backgrounds and professional experience, that's one. And then, of course, as, as Tolu said, the, the quality of the, of the faculty as well. We have the top practitioners in arbitration, investment arbitration, commercial arbitration, sports arbitration, maritime arbitration. You have the top um, practitioners who um, teach this course. And the, the methodology is also very different because you have a blend of theory and practice because you have academics, academics who teach the course. Thankfully, we had some, a, a professor from um, Colombia, Professor Berman that um, Tolu mentioned, also took a course. And I was privileged to be um, his, his student. But yes, we, it's, a, it's a blend of academic and professional and, um, and uh, practicals. So you have both of them together. And you also, you also get to do moot competitions. You also, you, 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 you are in a, you're putting a, like a, a position where you argue, where you draft, um, um, draft memorials, where you try to persuade the tribunal. So you don't just sit down in class and learn, you, you actually they try to simulate a, 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 an actual arbitration hearing, which is great. And then you have the chance to also go for, net, uh, for, for conferences and seminars. So you get to network with people in the, in the, in the field. So for me, the masters, the, the, the LLM um, program was, um, is very, because I'm not done, I should graduate by September, but was very um, beneficial and useful in knowing people and in getting more knowledge about um, arbitration. But that might be a mid thing. That is the program I chose. Then to the second question, where would you advise? As Tolu has said, um, the US is a very great um, place to um, get your a master's degree in um, if you intend to enter into international arbitration. Um, the UK, of course. I also think that um, Apart from jurisdiction, you, all, you may also want to consider the program you are going for. So when deciding where you want to do your master's, it's, it's very important to consider two factors. First, the, the, the reputation of the program. I, maybe I'm, I may be wrong, someone else might, might think differently, but um, the reputation of the program and also the opportunities that will be available to you after your program because a master's is a very big investment. You put lots and lots of money into it. So you want to be sure that after all that money that goes into it, you want to reap benefits as soon as possible. So you want to go for places where you can get an opportunity. And how do you know the places that you will get opportunities? We talk to alumni of the school. You look for people who have graduated from that school. Where are they now? What are they doing? So this is how you get to know what are opportunities. You also want to look for, are there any Nigerians or wherever your home country uh, um, is? And where are they now? What are they doing? So these are the kind of things you consider. And there are five top places for um, arbitration practices. Tolu has mentioned um, two of them, New, um, US, particularly New York, then um, um, UK as well, London. Then there's Paris, where Tolu works, France. Then there's Singapore, and there's Geneva, where the meet is located. So these are the five like really known places for, of course there are more, but these are places people go. So that is where the work is done. So if you have a program that is really good and it's located in any of these places, I think you, you, you have a 
you you have a good master's and um, LLM program in your hands and you should you should take it. Thank you very much, Zara. You really, you know, went deep into answering that question for us. And we've talked a lot about LLM, you know, and we've also talked about work experience, but apart from doing, probably working in a law firm and doing an LLM, is there any other way you think a student who is interested in pursuing a career in international arbitration can, you know, further their career or do anything, you know, to, to advance in their career? Tolu, would you like to take that question? Um, yes, so it's, it's sort of a spring of the, what, what I said earlier. Um, Again, you generally, if you're going to go for an international arbitration, you have to have a command of language. And uh, I think the former ICA president, Donald, um, Donovan, he said, uh, you do yourself a lot of good by having a command of language in, in international arbitration. Of course, by command of language, you mean, you know, first of all, English language, uh, but you also want to know other languages. You want to speak French, um, you want to speak uh, Spanish, you know, and there's no clear court um, um, route to getting into um, uh, the market. But I mean, and, and things that you don't consider important can be important. You might just be higher apart from what you have, your qualifications and uh, doing well in school. And um, we, see, we see it all the time that, oh, um, she speaks Spanish. We say, oh, great. Um, she can help me on the case I'm working on. And, and, and so learning, you know, another language, uh, it's, it's really, really important. And you have the, the opportunity, the time to do it when you are in school. Uh, try it online, you know, there are all kinds of Abdul lingo and all of this, you know, just start learning. Um, I say um, French, uh, Spanish, um, of course, <laughs> Chinese is it's very difficult, but if you can, and try it, and that will be useful down the road. And then as student, like I said before, you have to pay attention to contract law. Um, there's a case I'm doing right now, and I'm basically um, trying to get a tribunal to uh, use the PS in the corporate bill as the basis uh, to bring an arbitration claim against a parent company. And now, uh, your old school corporate bill is useful um, in uh, international arbitration practice. And, and that's the landscape of international arbitration. That's how it works. So pay attention to your contract law. Um, your international law, if you take it, um, private public, it's useful. Uh, and if you, you are done with studies, try to uh, maybe your NYC years um, and maybe a year after, maybe like take two years to work in a litigation firm. Um, gets used to, you know, the idea of uh, preparing for hearing, uh, preparing a witness for hearing, cross-examination, uh, re examine all the stuff. And that's what you're going to do. Uh, you get used to drafting. And um, drafting uh, court processes is the same way we draft uh, arbitration processes. And um, draft emails, um, you know, most of my daily work involves draft, uh, drafting emails. And I responding to the tribunal, email to the other side, emails to the client, uh, internal emails, and, and all of this. And uh, trust me, it's not as easy as it sounds. I mean, it's a lot of work. So um, yeah, you do yourself a lot of good by, uh, by doing those language, litigation experience in some way, if you can, paying attention to your contract and international law uh, will you, you know, stand you in a good step. Thank you very much to Lou for that question. So now we have questions in the chat box for our guests. Unfortunately, we might not be able to address all the questions in the chat box because of time. We are running out of time already for this panel session. But the first question goes to Mr. Tolu, and it says, how do law firms negotiate multi-jurisdictional disputes? Are you often in contact with White and Case in other jurisdictions? I guess that's what the person means, because it says White and Case's other offices. 
Um, do, do you yeah. understand the question? Yeah, yeah, I, I, I think I have an idea of your question. Um, so we, we're a big law firm, but, but we're, it's the same law firm. Um, we have uh, 40, I think 43 offices in 40, yeah, we, we offices in 43 countries or something. Oh. Now, and it's, it's just a, a global firm. If I need to do something in uh, like yesterday or, or two days ago, I got an inquiry from uh, Abu Dhabi office asking me um, to recommend a Nigerian lawyer to help them uh, address a question uh, of something that they're working on in Abu Dhabi. Uh, and at other times, I reach out to uh, the American office. For example, as I was trying to set up this call, uh, the Paris office is closed. I had to call the people in, in New York to help me set up the Zoom call, right? And it's, 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 the, same, um, it's the same law firm. And so when we have this with multi-jurisdictional dispute, uh, we just pull resources from the different offices. And um, like if you're gonna do work in Nigeria, arbitration work in Nigeria, for example, and you're based in Houston, Houston, Texas, United States. Uh, I mean, look at the time difference and all of that. It's not likely uh, that you know want to have uh, somebody uh, from the Paris office, from the London office, uh, or your team, especially uh, we have Nigeria in, the, in this office. So you want a Nigerian lawyer who is familiar with the, uh, the terrain in Nigeria, and who is part of the firm, and you put them on the case, you staff them on the case, and they are part of the network. Uh, and so that, that's how it works. And when we don't have resources in a local jurisdiction, for example, uh, we work with local firms. Um, so I'm, I'm doing a work in, in Chile, for example, I'm working with a Chilean firm, a local um, firm, but I, you know, we work together, they are copy on emails, back and forth we go, and we prepare the processes. I send it to them. They make in, input on Chilean law before we submit to the tribunal and all of this. So, so it works really well and seamlessly. And, and that's one of the key attractions of international arbitration, the ability to work in multiple jurisdictions uh, to provide um, efficient and effective solutions to our clients. Thank you very much too, for that insightful answer. So we have, one, we can only take one final question from the chat box because we do not have enough time. Um, Chizaram, I would like you to address this final question. And it says, is it advisable to specialize in a particular aspect of arbitration? For instance, focus solely on investment arbitration. For now, I, I, I don't think it is at this point um, as an undergrad. I, I think the first thing is just to get into arbitration generally, if it's domestic, international. First, get your get get your feet into um, the door. Then you can now um, probably when you have garnered enough um, experience in basically everything, you can then decide to focus on. Oh, I want to do investment arbitration, or I want to do just commercial arbitration. Um, you can decide. Oh, I. I, I don't even want to practice arbitration in a law firm. I want to be just a, a tribunal secretary, or I want to just attach myself to an arbitrator or, or an arbitration institution. So there's so much, there's so much to do. There are so many opportunities, even within the arbitration field, that I don't think right now as an undergrad, you should just restrict yourself to um, one area because really, especially in Nigeria, um, arbitration is a very, uh, it's, it's a developing area of, area of practice. And there are very few people who do it, practitioners. So when the work comes, you will find that most of the time it's being, it's circulating among maybe the same people. So to even get in at all is, uh, is a feat to you. It's like, it's an achievement, get in there, Work your way and do everything first. And then maybe later on in the years to come, you can decide to do something to specialize in an area.
Thank you very much, Zara, for that answer. Unfortunately, we cannot take any more questions from the chat box because there is no time again. Thank you once again, Tolu and Chizara, for gracing us with your presence and join me in appreciating our guests in the chat box. You know what to do. Hashtag Tolu, hashtag Chizara. We have now come to the end of the arbitration panel session. I remain Veronica, I know, and I would be handing over to Titi Lokwe Adedukun. Wow, thank you so much to our panelists, Mr. Obamiro and Ms. Um, Ms. Chizaram Uzodima. Thank you so much. I learned a whole lot and I'm sure that the panel, um, sorry, the participants have their notes full. So um, yeah, and I also like to thank um, Veronica Aino for skillfully, you know, steering the discussion and, you know, really, really um, engaging our panelists. Well done. Um, yeah, so we have now come to the end of the Lex Latia Career Seminar 2020. I am pretty sure that like just all of you, like um, just like all of you here this morning, I had a lot of expectations. And for me, my expectations were met. And I really hope that your expectations were met as well. Um, I can see so many things in the comment. Thank you, a very interesting one. So it's obvious that the participants, you know, um, have learned a lot from this session as well. Um, before we move to the last thing on our schedule, which is the closing remarks by the executive director of the center, I'd like to say thank you to all our panelists who have been with us from the first panel session of international mm -hmm. law to the second session of corporate law and now to the session of arbitration. Also, I'd like to say thank you to our moderators and last but not least, I'd like to say thank you to all our participants for being here all through. It's not easy, you know, to sit down here and be listening, even though, yeah, it's for your good. But I mean, you stuck here till the end, and I'm sure that you've learned a whole lot. Now, um, before we go, before I move on to the last thing on the schedule, I'd just like to remind everyone that the Lex Latter, um, the Lex Latter Center, I mean, will be having its Lex Latter Online Research and Policy Conference 2020, which will hold in November, to, um, November 7, on November 7, I mean, 2020. 20 and will be themed the future of international criminal justice in Africa. So please follow us on social media, you know, engage with us, send us an email, you know, to know, um, to find out more details and ask how you can be part of the conference. Also, the Lectata Center has created a post-seminar survey, which is going to be available in the chat box right now. It should be available very soon if you can't see it yet. Please Fill this lets us know your experience at the seminar and how we can make future Lex Latter events better for you as well as other participants. Also, and last but not the least, um, also we want to know what you learned during this session, who you networked with, and the important nuggets. So, you know, tag us on Instagram, tag us on LinkedIn, and we will post, we'll share, we'll like. Um, and also use the hashtag Lex Latter Career Seminar. Um, finally, but definitely, finally, Last but not least, I'd like to call upon the executive director of the Lex Latter Center, Dr. Wale Kunuji, to give the closing remarks. Thank you very much, Titi. I'm sure you've all found this seminar very stimulating and enlightening. Many of you should by now be in a position to take more informed decisions regarding your future career. And in case you're still unsure of what to do, you can always get in touch with me any of the speakers after this event to discuss your options and concerns. We will be more than willing to provide some guidance in this regard. So as speakers, I say a very big thank you. We have learned a lot from you all, and we are very grateful indeed. To all our law students and graduates, I thank you for attending this event, and I hope you have all found this a rewarding experience. I would like to invite you to our research conference taking place on the 7th of November, 2020, the theme of the conference is the future of international criminal justice in Africa, and the invited speakers will be speaking on a highly contested issue of whether the International Criminal Court has been biased against Africa. Dr. Femi Elias, a former registrar of the UN Residual Mechanism for International Criminal Tribunal, and Dr. Ayodele Akinui, a Canada-based expert on international criminal law, have confirmed their intention to speak at this event. Details of the event will be posted on our LinkedIn page shortly. If you're not yet following us on LinkedIn, please do so now in order to receive timely, timely alerts in all our future activities. We have now come to the end of this event. Thank you once again for attending, and I wish you all a very pleasant weekend. Thank you. <laughs>